Yeah, I guess I can just start by just introducing myself a little bit. Um, so my name is Peter Thornberg. Uh, and I'm currently at the Political Sociology and the University of Amsterdam. But my, uh, I studied uh, for my bachelor, my master's, and my PhD. I studied in, in Chalmers, in the Complex Systems Group, um, which is in Sweden. Uh, so Christian Lindgren, uh, and Klaus Andersson, which is the master I worked with. Um, so I've sort of moved between the disciplines quite a bit, um, coming from sort of complex systems physics, computer science, and now in sociology. Um, so it's, that's, I'm quite interdisciplinary as a person. So and what I will present today, what I figure I present, is not uh, as much a, a single paper, but more of a description of the sort of approach to complexity that we're, we have been developing and that we're continuing to develop. Um, and so it's like, different publications that I, I will point to uh, and try to tie them together to a more or less coherent narrative. Um, and so this is both sort of way of thinking about uh, complexity in, uh, in society, but specifically maybe in, in, in digital data and big data approaches. Uh, and I will also have like a, a, a study on, uh, an example, a current case study that I'm, I'm working on that sort of tries to illustrate this. Um, so let, let, let me first sort of set the scene for like how this presentation developed and like how I came into this. Um, so I was at the Conference of Complex Systems, you probably many of you have been there. Um, it was in Amsterdam and I was presenting like two different papers. Um, and I mean the CCS is a fairly complex, uh, like it's a fairly physics oriented approach to complexity. Um, and usually I am more sociological, I sort of have a sociological way of thinking. Um, so I, I emphasize storytelling and interpretation. Uh, and I sort of argue that like, you know, reality can't be completely reduced to puzzles and like we, we still need these narratives and this interpretation. Uh, and I've never really seen this as like a very like extreme viewpoint. <laughs> uh, but like, I, and I think in part my approach sort of come from like my brother uh, as a sociologist. So. Uh, our dinner conversations, we like have a common way of thinking about things, um, and and usually I don't really get any negative feedback, like your uh, no adverse reactions from the audience. Uh, but this time it was like uh, an older, uh, clearly German gentleman. He he, he lifted his, his hand and he was like, "But so what do you want? Do you want astronomy to go back to uh, storytelling about uh, fairies carrying the planets on their backs, uh, or physics to thinking that lightning is the hammer of Thor?" Uh, and I, those were not in my conclusions, uh, as far as I remember. Uh, <laughs> just a side note. Uh, and he, so he continued with sort of his rant. He was very upset. Uh, and you're fighting a losing battle. Mathematics and physics, they've explained lightning, they've explained the movements of the planets, and it's just a matter of time before they explain the social world. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I found this like sort of explosion not only unexpected and a little bit intimidating, but also fairly interesting because it, it sort of lifted to something that has been shaping a little bit my thinking about complexity. Um, and it's sort of like a subterranean stream running under parts of complexity thinking, but it's often implicit. And it's very rare that it's sort of like the stream surfaces and comes into the open. It's more that it affects like different approaches and different methods. So. Uh, and it sort of lifts the question of how we think about complexity in society um, and how we view the social world, the complexity of the social world. So I think in this presentation is sort of about uh, continuing this conversation. Okay, it, of course, never really turned into a conversation, <laughs> uh, but with this physicist. Uh, well, let's call him the angry physicist because I don't know his name. <laughs> uh, and so sort of to look at this question, like, uh, what was his perspective? How does it differ against towards my perspective? And trying to lifting this this sort of underlying questions about society. Um, and so this is sort of the structure of what I will talk about today. So sort of uh, the old analogy of of society as a as a clockwork of uh, the sort of Newtonian approach, um, and the developing this new analogy of society as 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 complex as, as a swarm, for instance. Um, and and then going into looking at sort of uh, so that's like a historical and then looking more at the the limits of this what what do they leave out uh, what what does what do they show and what do they hide um, and then trying to link complexity in more to the the philosophy of science like the the approaches the way that people in sociology for instance are thinking about the 
the ontology and the nature of, of society. And then uh, a, a case study that is sort of like a little bit up on its own, uh, but that sort of illustrates uh, this way of approaching uh, digital or society and uh, digital systems in particular. Um, so, so can you begin by saying that this notion that the, the angry physicist, uh, as we now call him, uh, so eloquently expressed that it's it's not a new idea uh, in any way. It's it can be sort of be captured under the single world of the word of, of naturalism, which is this idea that, that everything exists on in a smooth continuum from from atoms to cells and from cells to uh, to human behavior and from from human behavior to societies and social structures. Um, and it's sort of the idea that, that the difference between natural and social is, is merely a question of, of how far our scientific tools have come. That we're seeing the unstoppable expansion of, of capital S science. Um, and traditionally, this, this approach, this way of thinking has been associated to, to determinism and to the sort of Newtonian clockwork universe. Uh, the idea that like we can predict everything exactly. Like we, we just need to find the loss of the system and then like a given state and then we can just put the state into the loss and like, oh, we know everything. Um, and, but that's probably not the perspective that this angry physicist, uh, this particular angry physicist was, uh, was representing since he was at the complexity uh, uh, conference. Uh, and also this idea has sort of been on a retreat during much of the 20th century uh, through like uh, a, a number of setbacks. And, and one such setback is the, the sort of uncertainty principle of, of quantum physics, um, which meant that physics has felt to force to abandon the idea of, of exact prediction because despite what Einstein sort of uh, protested, that God actually does seem to throw a little bit of dice. Um, and a, another example is the sort of mathematical notion of, of chaos. Uh, so even if a system is deterministic, we can never <coughs> know the initial state with enough precision uh, to actually be able to pre uh, predict it under over a long time, and this is something that this video uh, illustrated: is the, uh, so that the Newtonian laws become analytically infeasible, even with just the three interacting bodies. Uh, so it was like with with these sort of setbacks in this context uh, that a group in uh, met in 1984 in the Santa Fe Institute uh, in New Mexico. Uh, and I like I know that you guys probably you've heard these stories lots of time, but uh, so it, it's it's a sl I, I've heard that you're uh, never supposed to have more than 10% new material in a presentation, <laughs> and I, I hope that I will uh, achieve those 10%, but <laughs> <laughs> even with this audience, but <laughs> I'm sorry if, it, if I don't reach the entire way. But <laughs> anyway, so uh, so in, in this meeting anyway, and, uh, it was mostly physicists who attended this meeting, and they came out of the atomic bomb research of the. Uh, Los Alamos Laboratory. Uh, and so in this meeting, they sort of started thinking about tying together a bunch of different developments in the sciences. Um, and they found like this way of thinking that some systems in, 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 in science in, or in nature seem like distinctly unclockworky, uh, that this just needs to be approached in another way. Um, and like, and luckily, in, in some ways, like another approach had already been been rearing its head in, in certain parts of the sciences, uh, like nonlinear dynamics uh, and statistical mechanics, and in certain aspects of thinking about biological evolution as well. Uh, and in, also in things, maybe primarily in things like this, the, the, the this is the Conway Conway scheme of life that you've probably seen before, but this is a, a much cooler continuous implementation. Uh, it's really hot. <laughs> uh, and but it, so, the game of life and things like cellular automata, artificial life, and so on. Um, and so basically, what what what, people, what they found was that uh, complex pattern can arise from very very simple local interaction, local rules of interaction. And like the rules behind this is incredibly simple. Uh, it's just yeah. Um, you, you've probably heard of the, the comic game life. I'm, I'm not going to get into it. I, I, it's too too interesting. I just get stuck in it for hours. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but so th these type of things they brought into light uh, something fundamental about nature that had never really been totally visible before through the sort of lenses of the of the Newtonian Cartesian approach. That it captures something organic, something fluid. Uh, those aspects of of life and of nature that had previously been sort of left out. Um, 
And what Santa Fe Institute did in, in this meeting and, and to continue was to collect these pieces of ideas and, and put a common label on it. Uh, and that was the label of complexity. So basically, they, they found a new type of system and they also find a new type of science that sort of, to sort of go with it. Um, and usually when, when you explain uh, this concept of complexity, uh, it's, it's common that you draw a line like this, that between complicated system on one side and complex on the other. So, so on, the, on the left side, we have the classic sort of clockworky systems. Here in the example uh, is a car. Um, and so cars, clocks, spaceships, and so on. Um, and what's particular with this system is that the, the mechanisms are, in a sense, located in the components. Uh, so that the components have rather specific tasks or functions, and, and then they sort of build in each other, and they talk to each other in very simple, structured ways. Um, and this is sort of related to the traditional way of thinking about uh, systems in nature, the, uh, and the sort of reduction, reductionist approach that this picture sort of illustrates sort of comes natural with this type of approach, right? Because if you've never seen a car before and you want to figure out like how does it work, uh, it sort of makes sense to like you take it apart and you figure out oh like the engine does this and the engine interacts with this part and like you, you figure out the, what the parts do and, and through that you understand the, uh, the entirety, which is like what we sometimes mean when we say the reductionism. Uh, and on the right we have a completely different type of system, which is exemplified often by birds or flock, but here by uh, weaver ants uh, trying to uh, build a, a bridge uh, across a gap, uh, or trying to, they're quite successful. Um, and so, so sort of these this systems have a tendency of feeling quite strange to us. And uh, what I think you can say feels strange is that the, their sort of functions, their mechanisms, are not located in, in an, any single component. Um, so when these weaver ants are building this bridge there, they're uh, cooperating to do it, but if, if we try to sort of take the car approach and like, okay, we take out a single ant and like, what does it do? It's like, well, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really do anything that makes sense. Like any single ant is like really, really stupid and can't really solve any problem. And like, it just sort of follows the smell of hormones and pheromones and like, and the bite stuff that it comes across. It's like, uh, you're sort of like, well, it's very stupid. But at the same time, it's like, uh, Ants are like the most successful species in existence. Like even the weight of ants is more than the weight of humans. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. But uh, and that's that's for like a species that I mean they're so dumb so that they, they can get stuck walking around a tree following their, the smell of their own pheromones <laughs> and then they walk until they starve to death. <laughs> that's like so you can sometimes find circles of dead ants around trees in nature. And I, so, so it's quite surprising that they're that stupid, but still so successful. And it, it sort of leaves the question: like, where is the intelligence of that? Like, where is the where is the function? Where is the bridge building? If it's not in any, any like, there's no bridge building component. Like, they're all sort of doing it. Um, so the the mechanism is sort of uh, everywhere and, and nowhere at the same time. This bridge, bridge building skill. It's like. The, the stupidity sort of, the individual stupidity adds up usually to a, a common, a sort of a collective intelligence. Um, so in a sense, like the, the, the intelligence is between the ants. Uh, it's in their relations and their interaction. And we can say that it emerges. Um, it's a, a, the popular concept that you've probably all heard of. And so this notion or this like way of thinking of, of systems was the foundation for complexity science and uh, of the Santa Fe approach. And, uh, Santa Fe basically brought together a whole set of, of methods and theories about these type of systems and uh, often sort of borrowing them from other places uh, like network analysis and agent-based modeling, dynamical system theory and so on. Uh, and they were mainly centered around this, this use of computers. Uh, because if, if we approach the ants, like the weave, the, this, uh, uh, their, their task by not by trying to take them apart like we did with the car, but we try to, to instead, uh, using a computer, we try to model them. Uh, and we sort of look at what an individual ant does and then we sort of scale it up in, in a system like this. And what we see is that we actually get some intelligent behavior. And I mean, you get like stuff like ant colony optimization is based exactly, it's optimization algorithms that are based on, on ant behavior. Because it turns out that ants, the sort of way that they find food is they're super efficient. Uh, and you know, like solving stuff like the traveling salesman uh, problem, 
which is an MP-complete problem. Uh, it's really, really efficient to use uh, ant colony optimization for that. Uh, I have, still have nightmares for, for those uh, uh, homework tasks in <laughs> complexity science when I was in the master program. Um, but yeah, so this simulation is the simulation of ants looking for food. And so sort of this approach of like, uh, of using computers and using these different methods for, for approaching the systems that it sort of expanded, became used in more and more systems, more and more things started to be seen as, as complex. Um, and so, so just this was sort of the background. This was probably the, what the, the angry physicist had in mind when he, when he uh, was so upset that he was thinking of society uh, through this approach, not, not as a clockwork, but through a, as a complex systems. Uh, and he would probably agree with, with Philip Ball uh, in his book, Why Society is a Complex Matter, uh, saying that like, naturalism, clockwork naturalism, it was a good idea, but he just like, drew on the wrong analogies. Uh, that society does not run uh, along the same predictable clockwork lines as the Newtonian universe, but is closer to flocks of birds and fish. Uh, so we might call this complex naturalism, just because it's nice to have words for things. Um, but so let's, let's take some example when it comes to society, like how does this new perspective, this new approach, so this is different from the old. Uh, so say we want to model a, a market, and so clockwork naturalists would probably go for the, the traditional uh, sort of neoclassical approach of we assume an equilibrium and we just analytically uh, try doing the calculations uh, based on, on the existing laws and so on. Uh, and we, we find a good demand curve. Um, but like a complexity uh, researcher, probably the anger physicist would be very upset also by this because like this misses a lot of things. This misses like exactly the ant hilly aspects of the system, right? It, it misses the complexity of the market. Uh, we can't just assume an equilibrium. How did we get to the equilibrium? Why are we staying in equilibrium? Like, uh, and it misses the interactions between the, the actors. Uh, it misses the heterogeneity. Like, it, you have to make a lot of assumptions to be able to analytically solve a problem, uh, as we saw with the three-body problem. Uh, you know. um, so like, the approach that a com complex naturalist would instead probably take is to look at the emergence of a macro from a micro. Something like uh, each trader is modeled as an autonomous interactive agent, and the aggregation of their behavior results in market behavior, uh, which is from a paper uh, on exactly this thing. Um, so the complex naturalists would probably instead go about it by like setting up a, a set of heterogeneous uh, agents and tr that each try to sort of optimize their own situation and they interact. Uh, they're not like isolated atoms. So if 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 we sort of more formally think about this, uh, we would go from the sort of law thinking, what's sometimes called uh, hypothetical deductivism, and which starts from assumptions and then apply mathematics to analytically deduce conclusions. Um, and as I said, this poses really strict limits on what types of assumptions we can make. But this approach is, is more what we can sort of playfully call uh, uh, hypothetical computational mass deductivism. Because it's still, we sort of still sort of make assumptions, but we're not using analytical methods to, to deduce every step. Instead, we're, we're permitting sort of mass interaction. We're permitting uh, like st stuff that would be never be uh, analytically solvable, probably. Uh, but we can, we can, that's okay because we use the computational methods. Um, and this opens a whole new world when it comes to what type of assumptions we can start from, what, what type, of, type of axioms we, we can start from. We can include stuff like heterogeneity, like relationships, interaction, and so on. Um, and so, so in this way of thinking, so you can sort of see complexity as a, as a lens that we, we put on. It's a new set of glasses, and, uh, and we can see all of these new things that we couldn't see before. We can see the stuff that goes on between the traders, sort of like the, the empty stuff of, of markets. Um, but so this sort of, to me, lifts the question. So like, okay, so suddenly new things come into vision, like we can see new things, but doesn't this mean that other things might still like not be, not be part of what we see? Like maybe there's some other pair of classes that can show something else, and it sort of lifts the question: What are the limits to this analogy, like to this analogical approach to, to society? And um, and what I would say, for and what others have before me, is that we're missing a sort of feeling of structure. We're missing the structural and cultural context in which action takes place, uh, and the sort of consciousness about the structure. So 
sociologist Margaret Archer put it, uh, once more, the object of sociological study has become the crowd. And finally, all that remains is, as Archer puts it, a human heap, <laughs> uh, which is quite well illustrated. Uh, which if you're, if you're a sociologist, uh, as I'm slowly becoming, uh, it, it gives you sort of the feeling that we're being fed old wine, which is you yeah. know, new bubbles, because the sort of suggestion of looking at society as a flock or, or a bird or a crowd um, it fits very well in with a sort of crowd-focused sociology of the early 19th century, um, or late 19th century, uh, like Le Bon and Tard. Um, but th that's also like, that approach sort of died, and, and for, for some fairly good reasons. And, uh, and this is sort of also highlights the place where complexity has worked really well in society, which is exactly crowd, pedestrian interaction, and so on. But society as a whole seems to contains something more that this person leaves out something else. Something that might explain why, uh, to quote Francis, uh, as yet applications of complexity theory to the social science have not yet been very productive. Uh, <laughs> it's an old paper, so <laughs> you might have changed your mind. <laughs> uh, or it might be one of the co-authors. <laughs> uh, so, so with this sort of like, this sort of context in mind, we can sort of return to this line that we, uh, we looked at before the sort of Santa Fe Institute style presentation to complexity, because, like, to be honest, we all sort of just, we we looked at this and we we're like, yeah, this this makes sense, and they didn't really question it when it comes to like the question, the like the real question here, which is like, where would society fit in? Like, would society be on the left or would it be on the right? And like, as as we seen, it's like it makes sense to have it on the right because like there's clearly like as we've seen, there's aspe aspects of complexity. And in society, there's lots of mass interaction. There's like definitely uh, anti stuff. There's emergence and so on. Uh, but we can also like actually, it, it also makes sense to have it on the other side because there's also aspects of, of complicated systems. Um, I, I totally messed up left and right now, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and those are like there, there's institutions, there's organizations, there's all these like very sophisticated socio-technological systems, uh, they have sophisticated functions, and they are very car uh, if you can make an adjective out of car. Um, and like, so, so if you think about it, it's like, why do we have a line? Like, does it make, why can't a system be both complex and complicated? Uh, but so, so that would sort of change the graph. It would go from, from just a line to, to actually spanning uh, a surface, a landscape, or a map of system types. And where does so society end up? Well, society ends up in, in the top right corner. It's a system that <laughs> <laughs> com combines complexity and uh, complicatedness. And we, we call this category wicked systems, which is like, uh, it's, a little, it's, it's a funny word, especially if you translate it to Swedish, because there's like no good translation. Uh, <laughs> so it just sounds really, really awkward. Uh, like naughty systems, <laughs> which is like even worse. Uh, but so the reason that we chose that word uh, is because it, it references the wicked problems in management theory that you might recognize as uh, Riddle and Weber, uh, 1973. Um, because this is quite like the, the way that they describe wicked problems is quite a good description of society. Um, because and it's stuff like this, like there's no definite formulation of the problem, like it's hard even to formulate the problem, uh, and there's not really any way of to knowing if like, okay, I've tried something, did I solve it? Like, eh, don't really know. Uh, so, and there's also like no clear, like this is the right way, the other ways are wrong. It's more like, well, this is good for that guy, this is bad for that guy, like, yeah, and so, and so on, like, and there's no good way of like testing, testing your solutions. So. And they have like 21 points that sort of describe it. And we, we've sort of taken this and like turned them into a description of the system and tried to ask the question of why, why these systems generate these type of problems. Um, but so, so the sort of realization that we're getting to here is that the combination between complexity and complicatedness is an emergent combination. It's not just additive. It's become something different. It's a wholly different type of system. Um, and so, so we can sort of like Ask the question like different, different how like um, and uh, so so sort of one way of thinking about that is like what do anthills and cars have in common? So, 
that's a terrible question. <laughs> they have a lot of things in common. But uh, a central difference is that, that so as I said, the, the differences are that the cars have their functions, their mechanism located in the components, uh, like the engine of the car. And the ansels have their functions sort of spread out, distributed, uh, everywhere and nowhere at the same time. They're distributed in the very interaction structure of the system. Uh, so this means that what they do have in common is that they both have functions as a system. They have both evolved or been designed or uh, in some other way turned into a system with, with functionality. What Elias uh, Khalil would call artificial is something that the system has in common. Um, and this makes them different from, uh, from wicked systems, we would argue, because, for example, uh, take an ecosystem under evolutionary timescale. Um, an ecosystem is the result of the evolutionary competition between lots of underlying entities. This system in itself doesn't have a function. It's, so sort of looking at its macrodynamics is like, it, you can't understand it by looking at, at it as a function, but it makes more sense as sort of the externalities as of the interaction of the underlying components. Um, so they're not something that's even like, in a sense, intended. Uh, so often sociologists, this is, this is like, a, there's a bunch of things that uh, when a physicist says them to sociologists, they understand completely different things. Uh, and system is one such thing. Uh, when physicists talk about systems, like it really upsets sociologists because sociologists sort of think about systems as something that has a function. So just to, just to not get any angry sociologists, <laughs> which I'm not sure we have any, any angry sociologists in the crowd, but, uh, so we can sort of call this an assemblage instead. Uh, because society is more like this, that it, it's like assemblage of interacting entities that are not subsumed under a common goal. Uh, and this is also has like ontological implications for, for what assumptions we can make when we're dealing with systems. Uh, because so sort of, why do systems become structured? Uh, like, why can we model certain systems? And this, this is precisely the question that Herbert, Her, uh, Herbert Simon uh, tried to answer. Uh, and so he was saying that, well, it, it's because some, some of these systems are near decomposable. We can like assume different levels. Uh, and in philosophical science, we often call those systems closed, um, closed versus open systems, which means that there's sort of like a natural way of cutting the system where uh, we can describe it. And so the, the question is, so why do systems become narrative composable? Uh, and, and Simon, uh, he answered this by a parable, which I really like, uh, between two watchmakers. And you, you might have heard this before. So one watchmaker, he sort of builds these watches in a hierarchical structure. He takes the smallest pieces, build a bigger piece, and then the bigger pieces assembles them to in the, in the logical hierarchy of, of, uh, of pieces. And, uh, the other one is like, it's more like probably if I was a watchmaker, <laughs> I wouldn't be a very good watchmaker because uh, uh, I would probably do more of this approach of just assembling them in a pile, like it's, it's just small components all the way up, <laughs> like yeah. Um, and what, what Simon in a more formally, formal way shows that the, the sort of hierarchical approach, the, the composable approach, it, it's much more adaptive, it's much more uh, stable and it's like, it's the type of system that will be likely to evolve uh, in basically any context. And, and that is why near decomposability is so common. Uh, but so there's an assumption to this parable, right? And the assumption is exactly what we just concluded was not the case for wicked systems. Because the assumption is that the system has a function, that it's adaptive, that like that it sort of matters for anyone that the uh, that the watches actually work. That that the gears and the springs aren't like competing for power over the over the watch, because uh, and what happens if you if you can't make this uh, this assumption? Because then this we don't fit into this parable anymore. We need to find a new parable. Uh, and luckily, uh, George Bateson uh, in his his wonderful book Steps in Ecology of Mind, uh, which I really recommend if you haven't read it. Um, and he, he points to uh, exactly an alternative uh, uh, parable. And it's, it's this scene uh, from, from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and in this scene, so the queen is organizing a game of croquet. Uh, but it's, it's not an ordinary game of croquet, as you can see, because in, in this game, the flamingos are used for clubs, and hedgehogs for balls, and soldiers for hoops. Uh, and this, of course, affects the game dynamic in, in certain important ways, because the flamingos, as you can see, is really doesn't like being used as a, as a club. 
Uh, and uh, so, yeah, he sort of interacts uh, and tries to avoid it. Um, and also, like, the ball might just walk away even if they actually hit it. Um, so in Bateson sort of describes this, this type of system that this develops in as a, a total model. Uh, because, uh, and he suggests that it's a very specific type of system, uh, which is linked to the fact that this, the game devices are alive. It's like uniquely because of that, because they are adaptive, they're even innovative. Uh, because if, if, if the balls had just been uneven or the club's a bit wobbly or the lawn bumpy, you can sort of learn, you can adapt to that, you can like handle it. But when everything is adapting to everything, it, it becomes impossible. Um, and, and this sort of points to something because this is sort of the reason for near decomposability is that in the adaptive system, predictability and order is in everyone's interest. Like we're cooperating, it's good if I know what you're doing. Uh, but in, in these so systems, it's, it's not in anyone's interest that you can predict what I'm doing. I want, you, I want to be as unpredictable as, as possible uh, to make it difficult for you to figure out what I'm going to do. So sort of the Trump approach. <laughs> uh, is a, a wicked approach to politics. Uh, <laughs> um, and it becomes a sort of arm race against uh, messiness. Um, and then, so this captures at least some of the strange nature of, of society, uh, what makes it different from, from most of the, of the natural world. Uh, because it's also that when patterns emerge in the interaction between players, that is also something that players can detect and adapt to and interact with. Uh, so this means that there is, in a sense, no, there is not decomposability because we don't have a scale separation. We don't have, uh, you can, the individuals are interacting with the rules of the game, with the, what emerges of the game. So it's called second, second order emergence. Um, and so Margaret Archer puts this that, uh, it's probably tiny, sorry about that. Uh, it, she describes it as, as society is uncontrol uncontrollable and quintessentially kaleidoscopic in nature. It's shaped and reshaped, but conforms to no mold. It's pattern and repattern, but it's confined to no pattern. It's organized and reorganized, but its organization needs comply with none of its precedents. Which is a very nice and poetic sort of description of of this sort of ontological change that is going on in this type of system. But, and this also, I mean, it has quite a important implications also for our methodology, right? Because for complicated system, we have this whole host of, of sort of tools. We can reduce them down, we can understand them. For complex systems, we now have like the, uh, the sort of complexity approach where we, we can make assumptions, we can build a system up, and we can, we can sort of approach and try to understand the mass interaction. But for weaker systems, we don't really have like any set of, of approaches, right? Uh, that can completely capture them. So this must have implications for, for also for our, our knowledge claims. Um, so this is a, a second paper that continues on the same thing, which I was gonna say that was under review, but tonight it got accepted finally. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, after many uh, a conversation with the reviewers. Um, but so in, in this paper, we sort of continue something in this track by increasing the resolution of this, of this pain. We, we look at, uh, because if we think of it as a map, and there's actually different types of systems that have different histories. They're like, you know, like the Santa Fe Institute sort of claim complex systems. And what we're saying is like, there's a whole nother, uh, a whole lot of institutes that can start up around other types <laughs> of systems. Because like, complex is one type of systems, but we have wicked, we have trans complex, uh, sub wicked, and trans complicated. Mm -hmm. And so just to <laughs> so quickly describe them, because like, I was originally when I thought about this, it's like, yeah, it's like, I was thinking more as a sort of gradual transition, but there are really, it's really quite useful as an exercise to go into looking at how these systems evolve, uh, and also thinking about stuff like how did society evolve if we look at it through this, this sort of path, this sort of graph, like how it moved between different historically, um, uh, between different parts of the spectrum. Uh, so just mentioning quickly, sort of like trans complex systems. This, these are complex systems that have some type of herding involved. They're like some type of molding that it's still emergent, but it's emergent in a direction which is in the interest of perhaps some external player. Uh, so social media, we use that as an example, is true uh, to different extents, but uh, there are certain, uh, the, the sort of social media tends to be quite emergent, 
tends to be quite chaotic. There's a lot of emergent effects, but at the same time, the platform owners sort of shape how they want you to interact, uh, and they can sort of affect the sort of social practices developed on the platform uh, with their interest in mind. And they use a lot of interesting techniques for that. Uh, and with trans-complicated systems, which are sort of complicated systems that are not completely complicated, there's some stuff that sort of breaks the hierarchy. So, uh, so probably uh, an example that comes close to heart to a lot of you, if you've ever like looked at uh, uh, open source software development, for instance, is like badly programmed uh, software, uh, where it's like there was a structure in mind they wanted to have a complicated system, but then like increasingly they were like lazy about it, and you have all of these cross connections, and then you change one thing here, and then the entire thing just explodes. Um, and that's sort of, and another example is, is just organizations. Um, because organizations are often, like companies are often set up with a sort of top-down approach. You have like the different departments and like they have different purposes and like you're supposed to do this and give this thing to that person. But there's also this individual level where people are, like they're doing their thing, they're pursuing their own interests and that sort of cuts the hierarchy a little bit. Um, and so the organization can try to punish that as much as possible. And like on one end, you have organizations like uh, military organizations that are super like strict about you have to follow the uh, the rules of the organization. Uh, and then on the other side, you have more sort of complex approaches with like AGI processes and so on that are more like, well, we try to align your interests uh, with the interests of the company, like in the sense that you do whatever you want to, but we hire you because you're a complete nerd and you love programming and you like like to do nice things and like and you like the, the task that we're trying to achieve and and therefore you get more more self-organized system in a sense. But it's sort of you can still sort of understand it through this. Um, and also sub wicked systems are in a sense the same as wicked systems in the sense that you can't you can't reduce them in any dimension. Uh, but they are small enough to, for us to keep an arm in our heads, so we can like keep in track of everyone's sort of interests and why they're they're different narratives for uh, for doing things. Uh, and there's this whole um, thing that we could go into with like that. There's a theory, theory is that this is the context in which, you, which human intelligence developed. This uh, it's called the Machiavellian theory of of intelligence, which is that in the small uh, small hunter-gatherer societies. Increasingly, it became very important to sort of to sort of win the Machiavellian game, uh, to know what everyone was doing and why. So that sort of we our intelligence developed in this super difficult environment of like handling the social situations. Uh, and so yeah, I, I, we, we go in much more detail to it in, in the new paper. So, but uh, uh, let's let's keep moving. Um, so uh, one sort of aspect that I, to me, was sort of quite rewarding for thinking about complex and complex systems was just looking at this graph, is that when we say that a system is complex, what we actually mean is that it's not complicated. Uh, we're saying that we can reduce it over the complexity axis, and, it's, and we, we can capture it on that axis. Like, and in the same way, symmetrically, when we say that a system is complicated, what we're actually saying is that it's not complex. Uh, we can use the sort of systems approach, uh, uh, reductionist approach to sort of deal with it. We can reduce it over the other axis. But for, for wicked systems, you can't really reduce them completely over any axis without losing something. Uh, and it becomes a sort of when we try to do so, when we try to use a complexity approach to uh, to to society, for instance, what we're actually capturing is like, if you think about it nerd nerdily, uh, a sort of lower dimensional projection of the system, um, which is like in a sense all well and good, but when we depart from from methods, so this is sort of illustrating this like lower dimensional projection of a of, of an object that sort of captures an aspect of it but it doesn't capture the complete system, right? So, it, and this is, it's sort of well and good because like it's sort of fine that we're just capturing an abstraction that we're seeing a simplification of reality. Um, and like in the same way, like so if we think of the first one as the complicated approach and this is the, the complex approach, it shows a different system. Uh, 
but they're both capturing some aspect of the real system. And, and, and again, like this is, it's sort of fine to not capture the entirety, but the problem becomes this. It becomes when you get stuck in your methods, when you let the methodology turn into epistemology, turn into ontology, and you, s you suddenly understand the system as just this two-dimensional object, this lower dimensional object. Um, and so the risk is that we lose sight of reality when we approach this. And, what, and this is Roy Bascar uh, referred to as the, the epistemological fallacy. Um, so put in more simpler words, we found a hammer and now everything looks like a nail. Uh, and and the, so how do we sort of avoid doing this? Um, well, we sort of need to remember, like we need to keep in mind the system that we're studying. We need to start with a meta-theoretical framework, an ontological perspective uh, that shows how our methods relate to reality. As Tony Lawson puts it, uh, to focus competently on specific aspects requires an understanding of the totality. Um, and so this, this re requires some, some formulation of the ontology of the system, right? Um, and, and what is an ontology? An ontology is something that asks your question, like, what are the entities of the system? Do we, for example, in the case of society, do we include institutions and, and social structures as, as entities, as actors with agency, or only people? And like, do we have a theory of causation? Like, when can we say that something causes something else? And so there's this argument, like, that also other has pursued that complexity science has sort of fallen for this reduction, and fallen for this thinking of society as, as just the complex systems and, and, and nothing more. Uh, which has in turn resulted in a sort of uh, what's called the so-called Brickhan syndrome, which is that uh, it's basically been used by social scientists uh, in this case to justify whatever they already believed in. Mm -hmm. um, which you, I, I, can, I think you can see that in, in, in multiple aspects, like in sociology, for example, it's, it's resonated quite strongly with very postmodernist ideas. I mean, they often love uh, uh, chaos theory in particular, and but it's also also sort of the positivist approaches that the Anchorist was, was representing. Uh, and in, also in other fields like economics, uh, which I uh, just submitted a paper on, uh, it has resonated both with the heterodox uh, approach, but also with the neoclassical. Uh, and there's, it's, uh, it's a sign that there's some ontological confusion going on. Um, and that we need to sort of place complexity in, in some kind of larger ontological framework that um, we need to connect it to the philosophy of science, and yeah. But has, isn't postmodernism specifically against having a, a total ontological framework? Um, that's like, like kind of like, like that's like yeah. what postmodernism sort of yeah. represents. It's an effect of getting away from a total ontological yeah. frame. Yeah. So then, but I'm. I'm it's I'm, a super tricky word, but yeah. I, I agree with you, and I, I think that you can argue that you can use complexity and chaos to argue for that that the, there is, it permits a sort of fluidity, or you can argue that it permits a sort of fluidity, that is sort of an argument against this idea of, of fixed ontologies. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I sort of come into this question a bit more later, actually. Uh, it's, it's a very, very keen observation. Um, so, so, just, so now we're in the need of a sort of philosophy of science to tie complexity up to, and like, uh, and then sort of tie wickedness up to, and where can we find this? Well, uh, there is sort of an entry point in the understanding of wickedness and the very sort of description of it, uh, which is this, this conflict, with, like this tension or this di dialectic between emergence and structure, between dynamic and structural complexity. Uh, because we can we can link this with a sort of discussion in, in the social sciences, focusing on the agency structure debate, which is like one of the biggest debates in, in, in philosophy of science or in the social sciences in general, almost. Um, so, because the critique of the only complexity or the only complicatedness perspective that I've just represented in the in the wickedness approach, it matches very well the critique in agency structure debate against functionalism and individualism. That wickedness fundamentally is the suggestion that the structure and emergency, they're part of the same process, they're entangled in a single dialectical flow, rather than in some way like reified in separate entities. Um, and this is similar to the Margaret Archer's uh, analytical dualism, um, which 
like is a stepping stone to a rather a larger uh, meta theoretical framework uh, called critical realism, which uh, was uh, developed by, for example, Roy Bascar. And it, it might be uh, similar, or it is similar uh, to someone you might know uh, more. I know that you cited him in, in one of your papers, uh, Mario Bunge, uh, his emergentist systemism. Um, he was very closely connected to the sort of critical uh, realist approach. Um, so it's sort of sort of parallel developments uh, in many ways. Um, and so, so this sort of connection provides an entry point to, to a framework compatible with complexity. Uh, and it's also like, you can very easily argue that, that complexity science and, and critical realism is not only that complexity needs this framework, it's also that critical realism in a sense needs this addition, this complexity, this understanding of complexity, of emergence. Because you can sort of, if you read a critical realist text, like they, they really they use the concept like emergence a lot, but you really get the feeling that they have no idea what it is. And they only have like this abstract philosoph philosophical sense of it. And as like a complexity researcher, it's sort of like, you really get the feeling like that you can contribute quite a bit with a sort of bring in concept like, like just the thing like speaking about near decomposability rather than spe speaking of openness uh, adds so much more nuance to it because you can sort of go into like why systems become that way and so on. Um, so so this, is, uh, this is something that we've sort of been working on like this combination. It's also continuing because this combination between complexity and, and critical realism has been suggested before and there's like different directions of like tentative development on it. Uh, and it's a little bit funny because everyone calls it complex realism, but no one really claims, like, <laughs> they all say that someone else invented it. <laughs> and then you can sort of, like, read all the way down to, like, the first papers on it, and it's like, nah, this, they don't really invent it. Like, they don't use the word, and, like, they're not really talking about it in the same way. So it's, like, it's a little bit so emergent. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So I won't go into like much detail about like describing this. Uh, I, uh, there's some some quite books, good books about it, and uh, uh, but um, and we're also like trying to develop it in some new directions that I will soon go into. Uh, but in general, I can say that just complex realism that sketches an image of the social world that is is very compatible with the idea of wickedness. That it's sort of open and organic, and boundaries are sort of constructed. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't like it doesn't go all the way out with postmodernism in the sense of abandoning the, the existence of reality or abandoning the idea that we can actually connect to reality and understand it. So it sort of sails uh, uh, between the Scylla, Scylla of positivism and Charybdis of, of Pomo relativism. <laughs> I've, I've never said those words out loud before, so <laughs> <laughs> no idea how to pronounce them. <laughs> It's like what you get for trying to be pretentious. <laughs> but um, but so, so what it sort of does is to, it sort of permits the, the sort of scientific pro process and like the scientific approach, but it adds a certain sense of humility to it. Um, and to tie back to the beginning of the, like, the angry physicist, I think that this humility in itself is a sort of rebuttal to the, to the, to the core intuition of the angry physicist. Because it, it implies that society, that his intuition that society can be brought into the, the realm of the natural sciences, that we can sort of reach some kind of uh, precision in its understanding of it. Uh, and like the idea that, uh, that the, this lack of precision, this lack of certainty that we have in social sciences, that, that they, they are part of like, it's because so, sociology is immature. It's yeah. because so, sociology is just not very good. Um, well, if, like the truth is, of course, that the lack of precision and certainty is because the, the the system that we're studying is uncertain, and like to a certain extent, if your prediction is certain in an uncertain system, then you're certainly wrong. Like, <laughs> uh, and so, so that sort of um, we realize that this question, I mean, it, it sort of has a tendency of like, oh, like, who's interested in this, like people who are really into complexity and like who are super nerdy about ontology and like uh, <laughs> and like you know like these books it's like different nerdy people beside each other and like no one actually reads it from the people like the people actually do things they're like over there and doing things <laughs> uh, but so this I think is 
I would argue is sort of changing now because uh, the relevance is growing. Because why? Well, because of big data, uh, I would say. Because the, the relevance of these questions, the relevance of complex naturalism as, a, as an idea has really exploded with, uh, with the advent of, of the big data age. Uh, because digital data has brought complexity into uh, in complex naturalism into the social sciences in the, in the way that complexity science never really succeeded. Because right? complexity science in like the traditional modeling simulation approach never really became mainstream in the social sciences for exactly the reasons that I've been talking about. Uh, but big data is is really having a very profound impact on, uh, on social sciences. And, uh, and it also brings in itself, it brings a sort of complexity perspective on social systems. And this is quite interesting because you know, it's the, the, the laser uh, at all 2009 paper in Nature, uh, where they introduce computational social science as if it were a new thing. They're, they never really reference the complexity of science and the computational social science associated to the 90s uh, with, with spatial simulation. And they sort of like, we invented it. it this has no precedence. Uh, but it clearly comes from a sort of similar way of thinking about it. So it sort of has this relational. But once it's published in Nature, that makes it ontologically it makes it real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it, it's as we were saying that's about true. impact factor and truth. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If impact, uh, truth that's, is defined as impact factor higher than 20. That's a good approach <laughs> to describing the scientific uh, approach to truth, actually. <laughs> it's quite depressing. Um, so, um, yeah, like so, 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 why, why does, why does digital data have this this effect on on how we view society, on on, on the epistemology and ontology of, of uh, why does it bring in complexity? Well, it, it's not really a surprising. Like, if if you think about what data is available uh, online, it's it is very similar to the description of complex systems, right? Because uh, if, you, if you think about the traditional social scientific like census data, well, we have like piles like compa compartmentalized, like it's static, it's representative, uh, is like very rich in, in attribute data, but it has very little relational data. It's like it fits very well into this variable variance like system perspective, uh, and that sort of approaches the system through aggregation. And it's like that's not a coincidence, right? Because like we we designed the data to fit it. We created this picture of society. We created data to fit our methods, and those methods were sort of associated to like compli complicated perspective. But big data, on the other hand, is is it's not produced for scientific consumption. We don't go out and do it in the same way. Like of course, there's certain aspects of of like creation to it, but it's the sort of epistemological nature. Of digital data is not something that we like stamp on it, but it sort of comes from from these platforms. Like <coughs> you can say, the big data doesn't really hide the the relational complexity of the social that was there all along, but that we couldn't capture through census methods. And big data is like it's dynamic. Like if you compare it to the census data, it's like the total opposite in the sense that it's dynamic. Uh, it's not often not really representative of anything in itself. Uh, it's not a sample of anything. Um, is very rich on relations, but it's very poor on attribute information. Um, so this is a description more of a, a flock of birds mm -hmm. and a car, right? It has on on the, as a description of the data it has a sort of uh, abstract similarity. And it, so it's maybe not a coincidence that uh, that Twitter has a, a a bird as its as its logo, right? Because it's like it's a flock of of tweeting. Politicians, <laughs> with the big Trump bird flying <laughs> in the front, um, and then, so this is really powerfully, I would argue, brought complex naturalism into the social sciences. And like, I think this quote from from Lev Monovich, who's like a, a big guy in, in the field, uh, it illustrates it quite well. And that digital is what gave culture the scale of physics, chemistry, or neuroscience. Now we have <coughs> enough data and fast enough computers to actually study the physics of culture. Um, so that very much ties up those, uh, those two directions, right? 
And so then I would argue that this sort of approach is like basically what's underlying the computational social sciences field. And I, I think like <clears throat> as I already like tried to uh, uh, imply that there is a certain sense of truth to it. Like we have previously missed the sort of complexity of, of these social systems and like the like there's so much we can do with this digital data. It's a very useful place to be. Um, and we are required to sort of take this complexity approach, this computational approach. Uh, and the methods are often super, super interesting, super useful. Um, but again, it's like, it's the same as before. Like we don't want to lose like the cylinder. We don't want to forget about the cylinder, right? Uh, because <clears throat> you can also make the argument that while the epistemolo epistemology uh, and the sort of methodology of big data, it sort of pushes toward, towards this complex naturalist approach. It, we have like all of this data on the system. It looks more complex. It looks more, it is to a certain degree more predictable, right? Because it's, it's put in a box in a certain way. But as you were arguing, like digitalization also means the dematerialization of parts of our technological world. Like it, in that sense, it, digitalization is very much part of postmodernity, of the sort of transition of society where we have like the acceleration, uh, the what Archie would call morphogenesis, like the faster ontological change, uh, because the technological has always been like the uh, the stable, uh, like the material part of the technological that's always been the stable thing that stabilizes culture, that stabilizes social structures, uh, like. Um, there's a, a lot written on this, but sort of like how churches have like perpetuated uh, and strengthened the sort of ideology, the sort of uh, the social, the, the cultural aspects that are associated to them. The very physical structure is part of stabilizing uh, the this, this systems. And so the digitalization that allows just, you, you can update globally on every cell phone in the world, like two billion users can get a different experience and how they interact with each other because of some programmer on, on Facebook. Um, and it's instantly, instant technological changes uh, that is like interacting with, with also how we use the platform, like the social practices that evolve on this platform. Um, and all of those changes are of course also like A-B tested. Like every detail, every color on Facebook has been tested like hundreds and thousands of times to steer your behavior in certain ways. And so in, in this sense, like, well, Manavish is saying that well, it's more like physics than ever. Well, it's also more different from physics than ever because it's exactly these aspects, like this non-decomposability, uh, this openness, this postmodernity, whatever you want to call it, uh, is, is also something that it's ontologically emphasizing. So we have like this the epistemological and methodological implications that are in a certain way going in a totally different way, direction from the ontological implications of digitalization. Uh, which is an interesting tension, which is, and it's also exactly the tension that we're trying to sort of resolve, right? <clears throat> and what, what this in practice means is that this approach that computational social science has, it, it misses many aspects of the social world that can, can't really be captured. Um, and this is also something that has been, been criticized for in, in, in different parts of the social sciences, that it sort of fosters a, a, a weak surface analysis uh, rather than deep penetrating insight. Uh, and that it's reductionist and crude uh, in its application and its interpretation. Uh, this tendency of, of sacrificing context and, and clarity and critique for just automatic identification of really large scale paper patterns. You know, all of these papers that have like, we analyzed 300 million pictures and you're like, yeah, okay, what, what, like, why do you have that in the title? <laughs> like, <laughs> 200 would probably have been like, <laughs> uh, given more interesting conclusions. It's, it's because it's large scale, it's like impressive. Um, so, so this is really meaning that these questions that I've been asking are becoming more acute in a sense. And so the, the question that, that we, we sort of take from this is that can complex realism be adapted to, in the same way as sort of the new computational social science came, was, is different from the old computational social science? Uh, from complexity science and assimilation based approaches. Can we do the same thing with, with complex realism? Can we like find 
uh, a way of founding like an alternative, and a competitor, because a lot of people are critical of computational social science, but there's also not really any solid alternative to it based on a more sociological understanding, more ontological understanding of, of what kind of system society is. Um, we're working on that. So that's what we're working on. <laughs> uh, and what, like, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of question around like, well, what would such an approach entail and, and how does explanation look in the wicked world? And uh, so we were trying to write some kind of like, uh, we just started working on like a paper on this. So I have uh, one paper that sort of sketches the, where I've just been talking about, about the ontological implications and the sort of tensions there. Uh, and now we're trying to develop this approach in a more, more systematic way. Um, but and so it's still very like early in many ways. But we have some sort of heuristics uh, that we've thought about so far uh, when it comes to this approach. And um, it's so like I can just go through them. Uh, like these three points, which are of course there's we have written way too much. Uh, there's a lot, but uh, just these three examples. Um, so while we, in this sort of complexity approach, we have a tendency of trying to capture reality. And, this, and the same thing with, with different models and so on. Like the purpose is generally to, to capture the entirety of the system. Uh, but we sort of want to turn that into talking instead of the, of the complexity toolkit and of these tools as a sort of uh, computational hermeneutics. That their pur purpose is to support interpretation, not to replace interpretation. Um, and another metaphor that I quite like is to, to think of the tools like as crutches. They can help our intuition walk in, in cognitively different terrain, difficult terrain. But like just like crutches, we shouldn't expect them to walk on their own. Uh, and that wouldn't really serve any purpose either. Uh, so, so more of, of these tools as, as, as like a toolkit uh, instead of, of something that captures reality. Uh, and, and this is something that we've uh, sort of the sort of approach we've taken with two papers uh, written on combining, like topic modeling is super, super big in lots of social, social sciences, and everyone's trying to not think about how to interpret topics, how to combine them with theories, and like how to use them as an approach. So it's, it's become this sort of thing where it, there's a tendency of redefining the topics. It's like the computer program spits out a thing, and then like, oh, this is a thing now. like. And then you start seeing the world, like treating it as if it's real, while it's like actually capturing some aspects, and it might be super, like it might change completely with just a small parameter change and so on. And so we, we sort of try to, to suggest a more pragmatic approach to topic modeling and to combine it with critical discourse analysis as a sort of systematic approach. Um, and so the second point is, is of how we think about uh, it's about emergence and how we think about explanation, because there's also this, this sort of general tendency in the sciences of thinking that we've explained something when we've reduced it to a lower level. Uh, so we we understand the system when we understand how it, its parts and how they interact and like how that leads to this thing. Uh, which, I mean, there's there's just uh, it makes a lot of sense, and I, I agree that that's something that we should be doing. But I think that there's also this tendency of like thinking of things ex explained away, that like this thing doesn't exist anymore because now we understand how it emerged, uh, where it com came from. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, as Bunga and Manner put it, uh, explained novelty is no less novel than unexplained novelty. Like this, em the emergence structures will still exist and they will still interact with, with the world, even though you actually understand where they're coming from. Um, and this suggests a sort of approach that instead tries to more trace causal processes between and, and, and through structures and elements that are involved in them. Um, and this also implies something for how we interpret, because we still need like simulation models I think are super useful and super interesting often, uh, also in the social, social sciences. But it becomes more about how do we interpret the results, because it's quite easy that we go to this thing like, oh, we, we capture this and, and now we know this about reality. And it's like, it always leaves me a little bit like, yeah, do we know that? About, yeah, I, I mean, 
So it, it focuses on the question of how to interpret it and how to tie uh, model results into the larger sociological narratives. And this is something that we try to illustrate in, in this paper called uh, Modeling Free Social Spaces, uh, which is in social movement studies. Uh, it, it uses a sort of fairly traditional approach that which approach to, uh, to diffu complex uh, diffusion um, to, to study free social spaces in, in, in a very qualitative sort of discipline. Uh, and we just, the paper is entirely focused not on the model, but on the sort of tying together, like tying it in with the sort of existing narratives, which proved to be really difficult. <laughs> it, was, it was very hard and it was also very hard to get it past reviewers because you always get one physicist and, and one very qualitative <laughs> and they disagree about everything but they both agree that they don't like your paper <laughs> for <laughs> totally opposite reasons. It's like, it's too technical, it's not technical enough. <laughs> like, <okay. laughs> I'm not sure how to do with this. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, and so the third point is sort of like, again going back to the sort of cylinder, uh, so we cannot capture reality in our models, but we can capture some glimpses of it, some projections of it. <clears throat> and this is, implies an approach where we're really using an integrative and, and a pluralist sort of methodological approach. Uh, and <clears throat> we let the ontology of the system guide with me which methods we use, and then uh, we try to tie it together with a narrative glue. And just basically just avoid locking ourselves into like a fixed model of, of reality. Um, and this is not only like, so this is, I mentioned methods, but it's also about theories itself, like how we theorize the systems, because theories are also tools, right? They show certain things of reality, they hide other things. Um, so I, I method combination, and, but also theory combination. Uh, and this is something that we, uh, we sort of illustrate in uh, this paper in, in current anthropology. Uh, in, in which we take a sort of evolutionary developmental biology approach to uh, the cultural evolution. So we, we sort of tie it together, theories from, uh, from Ivo Ivo with uh, socio-technical theories about how society today changes. Um, and we use that to, to solve, to answer some, some open problems uh, about the dynamics of, of paleolithic uh, cultural change. Um, so the sort of wicked approach or the complex real appro realist approach is very much a, a transdisciplinary approach, I would say. Um, yeah, so those were like three points and uh, that sort of relates to the, how, how we, of this way of thinking that we're developing. Um, so, th so that sort of concludes this part of the talk. Um, and so it, it's, um, I can show some, some of the research that have we published on this and some that is like ongoing. I was very happy this morning to move one paper <laughs> over from, <laughs> from ongoing to publish, uh, even if it's forthcoming. Uh, <laughs> it's always satisfying. Um, so, yeah, and I, I think I've mentioned all of these papers already. Um, and the sort of way that we're working with this now is to really go in and take examples of and work with practical data and like sort of have this approach in mind and then see sort of like how do I think about the system and what does that tell me about the theories and like tells what does it tell me about the approach? Uh, because I think it's sort of like dangerous to get stuck in the, in the theory, uh, in part also because you'll never get a job again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so this is the, this, the finish of the sort of theoretical section and the next part I figured I'd go into a, a case study uh, that is an example of how we're working with this, and it's it's it's, it's short in this part. Uh, but I'm I'm not sure if you want to like want to do questions on the first part first because the second is sort of like, and I also don't know how, how I'm with time. Uh, okay. You want to do like a little bit of discussions now and then like you had an hour and ten minutes and we usually we usually go till four p.m. so it's three twenty-five now. Well, we usually ask questions yeah. in between and afterwards, yeah. it depends. I mean, if there's yeah. a nice flow, we continue uh, either what things on the table would have interrupted you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I can just go straight on to the, the case study part. Um, I have a, a yeah. quick question. Are you in the same group as Peter Slot? 
Peter Schlott? Uh, I, I know him, but we're not. I'm, I'm in uh, uh, Peter Schlott is at the Institute of Advanced Studies. Um, but I'm in, I'm in political sociology. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just had a meeting with him last week, uh, yeah. a brainstorming meeting on, on, uh, on cities, because yeah. uh, I'm also I'm like a little bit employed by the Center of Urban Studies yeah. uh, and also political science. I'm actually not really sure. <laughs> no, it's it's I just started. I'm like <laughs> still working with the big data. Yeah. And and yeah. So. Yeah. We we talked a little. We exchanged ideas a few times. So it's uh, uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies is like it's quite interesting. They're really starting up with a sort of yeah. interdisciplinary uh, complexity approach. I went interesting. to one of their talks a few weeks ago. One of my professors is working there now. All right. It's an interesting group. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, it, it's it's also very interdisciplinary. Like yeah. the place I like the, the meeting I went to was like very sort of qualitative city people and uh, uh, but also like the uh, Peter's Lutens. So Their big guy there now is apparently focused on uh, reinventing memetics. Reinventing. Uh, really. Reinventing yeah. Dawkins memetics <laughs> view. Um, I I had a, I had a few questions I guess bef before you before you move on. A yeah. lot of the stuff is is. Uh, Deeply connected to some things I've been been thinking about. So I sp specifically had um, something to say about you know the problem you're approaching with epistemology getting confused with ontology and mm -hmm. confusing knowledge for reality, and then you sort of think uh, you know ev ev you, you've got a hammer, so now everything looks like a nail. And yeah. I, I also I also felt like throughout my PhD I felt like there was something. Um, uh, I don't know. Cold, cold about complexity science, and in, in in the sense that it, it didn't seem to me to be philosophically informed, and it didn't mm -hmm. seem to me to have to to even engage in philosophy in the way you've you've engaged with philosophy in this in this talk. Uh, the the way I've sort of approached it in the papers I'm work, work working with is is how. Um, epistemology gets entangled with ontology, and I think you t you touched on that, but it's it's I think it's it's a it's a subtle point, but it's it's the way in which our epistemological constructs, in some sense, become alive and become ontologically real, yeah. and and I think that that is um, something that that actually challenges, in my view, this is just my view, and I think I'm maybe the only one who really thinks goes along this line is that the current orthodoxy is actually becoming and process oriented and change oriented and actually that the traditional view of of being and eternity and static fixed things everyone's against you know I've noticed this everyone is against static fixed things yeah and and actually I think that's actually the the contemporary orthodoxy is is to be becoming and process oriented against the old static fixed view but there's something Interesting, I think, that gets lost in this because because we're treating everything like like swarms and flocks, like you're saying. And there was actually something really interesting that you mentioned about the materialization of religion and how actually the material foundation of religion is eroding because we we can no longer hold on to anything and everything's becoming everything's disappearing and digitization in some sense. And the fixed and the static is is freaking people out. And actually, what 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 we're missing, I think, in, in the recent political movements is precisely, and this is, I think, not just in Britain and the United States, but around the world, is this, this return to the traditional. It's this return to something that you can hold on to, this return to something that you can actually identify as real. And it's not just this postmodern critical realism or something like that, but it's, it's real in the, in the pre-modern sense. That you know the pre-modern real sense is different, and I, just one more quick point, which is that, and this has stuck with me now for a while, which is that postmodernism focuses so much on the social system, and it focuses so much on the flocks and the swarming behavior that it actually forgets the the what phenomenologists and psychoanalysts identified as as real. And I think that, that like it precisely, I agree with your points about um, you know it's just impressive if you have a big about amount of data or a big yeah. you know big sample size, but you you're totally missing the psychological real or the phenomenological real of of, of 
of, of people. So I, I just wanted to engage on those those yeah. points because I think there's some potential further discussion there to be had. Yeah, it's, uh, it sounds like we have very much similar ways of thinking out that like to a certain extent different words. And it, um, yeah, I like what you were saying also with like the 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 sort of I, I find this very interesting with sort of we have this development in society that has been called so many different things. It's called like accelerationism, uh, postmodernity, uh, late capitalism. Uh, but this this common sense that things are changing faster and that things are becoming more liquid, as Bauman puts it. Uh, it's like everything dissolves into uh, and like and nothing will escape this. Yeah. Um, and now physical things have transitioned into to software and like which is also a type of liquidity, right? Um, so and I think that you also you also point to that there's this this uh, longing for something real, mm -hmm. which I think is like such a strong force in the sort of development that we're currently seeing. Uh, I think that the level of ni the level of social nihilism and the difficulty people are having knowing what is real yeah. is going to become an enormous yeah. problem. Like nobody like. The, yeah. And, and, I, and I and I think all of, like even the critical realism. I just recently looked up some of the critical realism stuff, and and because I hadn't really heard of it, but it it also seems to me to not be engaged radically existentially with the with the radical Islamic person, with you know whatever the what, not even just any any type of real existential engagement with realism. Like like I think that that we're so disconnected from that. Yeah. That. Um, you know, we're we're like when we discuss realism, like it should be able to engage with the person who wants to commit suicide. Like why? Like why do they? Why are they engaged in that existential? Mo or the person who just fell in love and can't explain why they fell in love. Like that to me should be the location of realism. But I don't think I don't know how we get there academically. Yeah. That seems to me to be a big br bridge to cross. Yeah, but 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 those things are real in social systems. Like if we're thinking about trying to get at social systems and and getting away from thinking them as just as big bird flocks and swarms and stuff like that, because you yeah. totally lose that with the bird flocks and the swarms. And yeah, and Twitter and like like you, I loved your your point about Twitter. There's this rising now. Uh, no one can read all the PhD theses that are coming out. And all the like, all you know, uh, the, we can't read. You know, all the information that's coming out is like, yeah, like there's now competitions. Can you tweet your thesis? Like, <laughs> can you just summarize your thesis in a tweet, please? Like, I know you've been researching for five years, six years, but can you just? Can it would you be really me? hard with this thesis. I, 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 and, and, we, and we get super excited. Oh, we got a publication, but like, could you just give me in a hashtag? Like, because <laughs> it's, you know, because it's so much information. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I find it, I don't want to get, I mean, I, I, this is just exactly the discussion that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. And I, I also like, I, I'm super fascinated with all the sort of paradoxes that exist in this, because it's this, this tensions between postmodernity and like the, the, and the opposite uh, that you also see in like in this, this online discussions, because I, I think it's, there's a lot of these sort of social movements of today are driven by this like longing for something real. Yeah. Um, and it, but it often plays out in very, very postmodern sort of uh, like like these online forums, mm -hmm. uh, like the like stream right, alt right. <clears throat> they're they're searching for this like going back to the, the real like yeah. the real men to the real uh, to the moving to the forest and like shopping down trees with access and like <laughs> very real things. But like the entire like way that they talk and the like the memes and like the the way that they're yeah. like it's super, it's so self-referential super, super postmodern yeah the yeah. self-referentiality <laughs> and like the way that structures like are the constantly yeah it's like structures are being brought in and like the, into the conversations and like being played with and it's like it it's super like it's really hyper realistic uh, or pseudo realistic it's like this sort of like postmodern concepts describe it so well, mm -hmm. while at the same time it's a reaction against postmodernity. Yeah. Um, and I, th yeah, I think those that those like contradictions play out in, in so many ways, and it's very central to our experience of, of, 
like contemporary society. I noticed another strange. I postmodernism is very strange. And one thing about what you just mentioned about postmodernism is like, is like it as a as a, a social system as like Martyr or, or the Lumanian school would talk about it is like it, it it just keeps perpetuating itself and it keeps going. Yeah. But nobody would like radically passionately claim I'm a postmodernist. Like it only exists as a negation. Like it, it only yeah. exists as like a point to be against. Like, <laughs> and I just don't know how to make. But it just nonetheless will just. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's <laughs> I mean, it's also like because uh, most of them wrote in the 90s, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 it's also because I think it's postmodernism is a tricky word yeah. because it's associated to so many different. I mean, I think that's in part why no one calls himself a postmodernist because like. Either you have a more specific name for it, or you hate it. <laughs> like, and uh, it's also a description of society that's linked to like the Bauman's like wi liquid modernity uh, and so on. Like that's also a description of sort of postmodernity, right? Uh, so it's a description of a societal transformation, of an ontological transformation, but it's also a description of the epistemological consequences of that transformation. Like science becomes more fragmentized, becomes more stood up, and like more self-referential. And therefore, the ways that we understand it also have to, we also have to, like, in certain ways, change the epistemology. We can no longer have like these large stories where we try to capture all of society, all of reality into a single story. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's, it's again the epistemology, ontological, ontology question. Well, my impression is that it's kind of a symbolic information of wilds because it's become so easy to produce symbolic information via the internet. All these symbols are being recycled and spread and multiplied. Yeah. And in the end, you don't see anymore what the symbol stands for. Yeah. The symbol stands for another symbol, which refers to another one, yeah. which refers to this, which cites that. And in the end, the reality disappears behind yeah. all these symbolic clause yeah. of special effects. It's, it's again Alice in Wonderland, right? Yeah, the king yeah. that made a map that was as big as the kingdom because he wanted to have really high detail. And then he replaced <laughs> the kingdom with a map. <laughs> <laughs> also, Baudrillard, uh, Simulacrum and Simulacra, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sort of the same, sort of that it's transition into a symbolic economy because that's, uh, as Frederick Ameson puts it, like it's, it's the pure capitalism. Is a change can happen so quickly. We can go from market to market super, super quickly, and we're only selling symbols. We're not sell selling anything physical, and like it will never run out because like my Nike sweater is a comment on your Adidas sweater, and they can comment on each other forever because it's just self-referential. It's like it's it's an, an emptiness. Uh, like you you can produce as much as you want to and sell as much as you want to, and the market will never be. Like. Yeah, because it's a self-referential, self-producing process where the one excites the other and the whole thing can just keep going and keep yeah. going. And everybody's forgotten what symbols initially were meant for, namely to represent some reality that's behind it. Yeah. And the reality that's behind it, people have lost track of it behind all these clouds of symbols. Yeah. Nobody remembers anymore what's the reality behind it. Yeah, it barely matters anymore in some ways. <laughs> I think on this on this on this point, the the real that I've become interested in from a psychoanalytic perspective is a real that isn't language but emerges from language. It's and it's not the reality behind it. It has nothing to do with the reality behind it. It's just an excess of language that you can't get rid of. And it's 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 kind of like it's kind of like um, you know. You, you, write, you write all these papers, there's a symbolic process that mm -hmm. goes on, and what emerges from you writing all those papers is some excess of language that's, that, you, you, that pulls you forward again still, like I've got to write that next paper. Yeah. And, 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 and no matter what symbolic operations you engage in, you'll never capture that thing that's pulling you on to the next yeah. symbolic operation. So it's, it's just this, this, and it doesn't. And the crucial thing is that it emerges in a in a very radically realist sense because um, it doesn't exist before language. Mm. It it doesn't. It, language emerges. It, it emer language emerges. This excess of language emerges from the operations of the symbols, and you can never. I love the language of grasping, capturing, because we all like you've been. Everyone's. Mm. You, 
can we grasp, can we capture reality? Like, yeah. And it's this excess of language that cannot be grasped, recaptured, it's out, it's indestructible. Mm. Yeah, so, so. I, I think it may be destructible. I think after a while, people will get tired of it. I mean, it's always when something is novel and suddenly it gives lots of possibilities, like an iPhone, everybody uses it. And then after a while, you will see, yeah, it's just an iPhone. Just use it to collapse and things and to. Uh, no, it's, well, what, it's what pulls you to write a paper non-stop incessantly. You'll just keep writing papers, writing papers, you, writing papers, writing papers. Writing papers. I mean, after a while, there's always a saturation point. If there isn't, I mean, you will die just getting stuck in these loops, <laughs> doing all the same stuff, perpetuating. <laughs> it's like those people who play who play w w World of Warcraft until they die. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but then they just. I feel like that. What is what, what humanity is doing? <laughs> looking like climate change yeah, perspective. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever. Either, either either you chase it forever or you die, and there's your two choices. Well, it's never forever. No, but the <laughs> die, <laughs> we'll die. We'll see. We'll <laughs> see. <laughs> there's the singularities. No, no. no. <laughs> the dying world is real. Then it's really back to reality. Well, if yeah, you yeah. effectively die, because you have forgotten the real world for the symbols and the real world comes back and, and catches you and you well, die, you die either then, way. Then the reality <laughs> and it's yeah. a, well there's a difference between dying sooner or dying later. So Yeah. It's still better to keep track of the reality than just But I don't I don't but I don't think that you I we'd have to, it would be interesting to do a study like like is do, is uh, is chasing this excess of language leading to earlier death? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, and, and someone who's, like, and, and I'm saying that that's a part of reality, so you can't contrast it with reality. Like, that's not reality, and this is the real reality, is the physical world that we're grounded in. It's, it's part of reality. It's real, too. Like, it's like your discussion, I read Marta's had a discussion with Weaver, and he was trying to con constantly ground you in physicalism. And that's ideological grounding. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's not... No, I'm not saying it's not a reality, but you can have an excess of something. Whatever is an excess, you eat too much, or you, there are too many uh, uh, animals of a particular species, there's an excess, and then there is a collapse. So if there's an excess of language, at a certain moment there will be a collapse. It's not that it will disappear, but there's just too much of it. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm sure we, are, we have too much of the symbolic information. But music, you know, fiction, and it's just pro, you know, proliferating like matter. Yeah, all these things are proliferating like matter. It's not that each of them, each one of them is something wrong with it, but they simply is too much. So, I mean, we yeah, spend so too much time yeah. in this so you, so, so you lose track of totality. You lose yeah. track of the whole. And you lose track especially of the, of the reality that's behind it, because you can... But that's not the point, though. It is the point. Is I mean, you can. Not I mean, I mean, let, let's say to take, to take a cliche, you have these women that constantly read a romantic novel of all these beautiful princes and pirates and and, and so ladies, and that becomes their whole life, and they and they and they forget to look for love in their own life because that fiction is all much more uh, stimulating to them than they... Yeah, because reality yeah. sucks. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <'Cause> it's <laughs> not, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like, they're not their fantasy novels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's not the point. It's not the point. Yeah, but it's the point. Yeah, you want to still go to give us the case then, right? Yeah, we can still give it to I just wanted to comment also, like, that uh, my PhD project just started. I was uh, working for David Lane. Uh, you might know of this. Uh, uh, and we were like sort of asking exactly the question of like what is underlying these processes, what is driving this this constant? Because you like there's a tendency to speak of, of well growth, capitalism needs growth, and it's like well what is capitalism and what is growth and like what is the mechanisms of that? Like you're not saying anything in this statement, and so we're looking at sort of the processes of innovation and what is driving innovation in society, like what are uh, the driving forces of constant change and like the driving forces of the acceleration we see in society. Um, so there's, uh, we, so we published quite a, uh, quite a bit in that project on that, and sort of like looking at the uh, accepted bootstrapping, as we call it, which is like the, the process of how change drives more change, how an innovation is, is found and that results in like the need for a new innovation. And this, exactly this is like symbolic interactions around. So um, I think that that is quite a useful way of thinking about it. And it's also a useful way for thinking about how to do something about it. Like, 
because to me it's like we need to transform like if we're gonna reach some kind of sustainability when it comes to like our output of of things uh, which is fundamentally not sustainable like we need to address those processes of innovation um, because that's that is what's driving this constant growth and we can think about alternatives in doing it in a more democratic way rather than a market-based way and in looking at values rather than just value rather than just economic value um, so that's it's, that's a quite a it's an it's a sort of intern I, I, don't, I shouldn't go into <laughs> that too much but it's, I, I wanted to just point in the direction of David Lane and like uh, reading some of his work on innovation uh, oh, David Abra Lane has been attempt to us so worked on acceptation yeah acceptation I, I yeah, that's yeah, that's something a bit yeah he doesn't write very much unfortunately he mm -hmm. he uh, he is like talks a lot and then other people write for him <laughs> and then <laughs> at the end of the paper like the entire idea comes from David Lane. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, you know Pier Paolo Andriano? Yeah, yeah, I know them. I, I, uh, he, 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 he was here, he gave uh, uh, also a seminar, and he uh, was a member of the jury of one of my previous PhD students. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, the, it's the EU project that funded my PhD most of it. All right, so uh, let's go into the case study. I was, I'm glad we have this sort of like high level discussion because the, since it's a case study, it sort of zooms in on a more specific level and goes a little bit different direction. And I also want to warn that it's like very, like all the interesting stuff I haven't done yet. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> but that's why I'm, I'm going to present it because then I can get ideas for, for interesting stuff to do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, I want to start with like an, uh, an anecdote, uh, which is like that when hand mirrors were first became like commercially available in the 15th century, uh, they became part of a rather strange practice, uh, strange social practice. That, because well-off pilgrims, when they went on their like holy pilgrimage, they brought a hand mirror and they took them into the rituals. They took them into the temples and uh, among like the relics and the effigies of gods and so on, and, and they held them up like this and they. So they could see themselves standing with the gods and with all the holy relics, um, and they actually brought the mirror home and they showed it to their friends and family as if it like was proof that they like still like. Yeah, I don't really see how it is proof because like, yeah, I can see myself. <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah, uh, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um, and so what this paper is not about is, is not about gods or, or hand mirrors, but I, I would say that it has to do with, with rituals and with selfies. How it has to do with how we present ourselves, how we see ourselves, and how that affects like who we actually are. Um, because this is the topic. And I want to say that also like all the pictures here are from the material that I've been studying. Uh, so it's self-referential. <laughs> and, <laughs> and probably unethical. Let's <laughs> uh, not yeah. go into that. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to go into the question about how social media shapes our identities, and specifically with like how we see ourselves, um, and how it place a part in the sort of self-perpetuation of, of social structures and social patterns in society. Um, and just to, to so, sort of set the theoretical background uh, for, for this paper and like what where it fits in, uh, in sort of the perspective on, on social media, which it started being very, like you might remember in the 90s, everyone was very, very optimistic about social media and about the internet as like this democratic meeting place. And people thought of it like, like Habermas's public sphere, like, we're all going to meet and discuss democratically. It's like it's not going to be leaders anymore. It's like Forum Romanum behind me. It's like w we can all meet and discuss freely. But it's even better than Forum Romanum because, like, on the internet, like, no one can see what race or gender you have. Like, you remember those discussions in the 90s? And like, so it's it's color and like gender blind, and you can like use like it's the fluidity of of um, mobility that's like inherent in identity. It sort of comes out on the internet, and like. Well, that didn't really work out. But it's like, so, like the optimism has faded quite significantly. Like how, like the internet, the picture that captures better now is, is something like this, right? It has to do, with like, identity expression, being central, and, uh, it's increasingly sort of argued that that social media might not be best understood through Habermas, but maybe better through 
theoreticians like uh, Irving Goffman, Randall Collins, and Norbert Elias, uh, whose focus was not on like the rational discussion, but more about the formation of identity of, of groups and of norms. Um, because for better or for worse, social media and online spaces have become spheres for experimenting with and, and trying to express your different types of social identity. Um, and as Nancy Fraser put it, uh, social media can be understood as arenas for the formation and enactment of social identities. Um, and they also, I mean, like, so it, it's this idea that before that you couldn't see what gender someone had, and like, it's all like there's no judgment online. <laughs> well, well, there's there's judgment online, <laughs> like, uh, because like the internet provides this way of like policing identity of, of through commenting and likes and not liking, um, and. So sort of, I'm, I'm sort of using Irving Goffman as my main theoretical source in this uh, or perspective in this uh, paper, uh, and he's he's thought of, of self-presentation through the lens of like of the theater, uh, and he spoke of, of like the masks that we're wearing, uh, and he's like we put on a mask and we go out on the stage and we we put forth our, our best side, we create a story about who we are. Um, and I think that, the, so this is like a way of thinking also of how gender is perpetuated, because there's this feedback process. We, uh, we do a performances, and then we look at the audience reactions. Uh, and through the audience reactions, we can sort of like see what expectations the audience have. Um, and as, as Gideon puts it, we, we live as though surrounded by mirrors in the search for, uh, in, this, in this we search for an appearance of an unblemished, socially valued self. Because we, we see these expectations and then we, we get the task of trying to design a way that we want to fit into these ex existing expectations uh, and, and how to relate to them. Um, and then we try to behave in such a way that we, that we fit in and then we go back to the audience, see our, which reactions are we getting. Like, did we succeed in this adaptation? And uh, Jenny Sundian, so sweet, uh, she describes this as a, as a sort of a mirror again, like that we, we see ourselves through the eyes of others, and in this feedback process, we we write ourselves into being. Uh, we relate our story about who we are to the social structures we see around us. Um, so that is sort of like a, a little bit of theoretical uh, approach, or like the way that people are thinking about this. Um, and so, so why is this question interesting to study? Well, primarily, like I, as like I was already talking about, is the or first is like the method theoretical reasons. So, sort of, uh, if how <clears throat> because the, this description about feedback processes and like of the theater and like uh, it's clearly a description of of emergence, right? It's the emergence of uh, of social structures, uh, and in a way, like the the data, big data. Uh, allows us to actually go into these processes and, and try to see the, the details of what's going on. Like, see the feedback between people and see the feedback between how structure influences people. Um, but it's it's not the emergence that is shown through this. It's not, it feels some way different from the emergence that, as we talk about it when we, we do modeling. Um, because it's like, humans are reflexive. There's all of this interpretation going on and people are aware of the, the structures, very much so. Um, and so there's this dialectic again, there's a dialectic between agency and structures and my sort of hope is to somehow like get closer to it in a more empirical way. Um, and so in the secondly it's like met methodological reasons um, because in, in this research that I will present it, I'm using some methods that um, to, to get closer to these processes and I'm, I'm using mostly computational image and text analysis, uh, it's a mixed method approach. And like so, it's methodologically interesting because like this deep uh, neural networks and, and this just explosion of developments in, in AI, uh, they're enabled us to look at so many new empirical questions in the social sciences. But like the the approaches in a, at least in sociology, like this is like the first uh, time it's being used in in, in this field, uh, which is it's, it's quite striking because uh, because of the third reason, which is like the empirical reason. Social media is having very, very profound effects on our self-perception, our identity, our mental health. And like, this is just some statistics uh, about how social media impacts us. 
it's like highly, highly addictive. And this is especially for, for youth. It's uh, has very strong impacts on the increasing anxiety, depression. Uh, like there was a new study on on, on sleep. Uh, Showing that just over the last 10 years, like the sleep uh, patterns for for youth has a really terrible development, like truly terrible. Like, um, and also linked to sort of cosmetic surgery and so on. Like if if you young people use social media, you can measure like they become measurably more interested in in, in plastic surgery after just like 20 minutes. Like, it's quite telling. Uh, mm -hmm. Cyberbullying and like how people view their bodies and so on. Uh, it has <clears throat> clearly, really, really dramatic negative effects, um, and it's it's very worrying. And at the same time, these the sort of fields looking at at self identity, looking at uh, how images affect us, is they're still sort of studying the traditional traditional media. They're studying uh, like gender and, and Advertising in images, even though like what 80% of all advertising is now online on social media, and and it's just they haven't followed because the data quantities. It's just hard to work with the data. Mm -hmm. So, and there's no big use of the the tools uh, that exist for actually studying images. So that's the sort of something I want to contribute with. Like, well, we can actually use these methods to actually study this data material, and it doesn't mean that we have to become quantitative. That we have to like abandon it because the field, these fields aren't that into <laughs> those sort of <laughs> simulation <laughs> quantitative approaches. Um, and so, yeah. So what, what I aim to do is to sort of uh, to bring in uh, these methods into this field, and um, and I also so I want to try to look at the the things that people have previously looked at in the sort of manu manual approaches to studying gender expression on, uh, in advertisement. Uh, I wanted to see if I can like, encode those using automatic computational methods and use it large scale, uh, which would allow us to sort of go into this realm of study. But I also want to do, which I think is the more interesting and relevant part for this talk, is to look at the audience responses. Uh, and this hasn't really been done at all. So basically, can we see gender being policed in social media? Can we see that you're deviating from your gender behavior? You get someone writes like, "fucking faggot." Like, can can we see that? How how is it expressed? Um, and uh, and this is so this is really tiring for me to, in, in the field. So data methods. Uh, I've collected about half a million pictures selfies from from Flickr and Instagram, uh, and used a bunch of tools to analyze them. Uh, I was lazy, so I used Google Vision instead of writing my own stuff, and it's also just better. <laughs> I was working quite a while with like implementing my own stuff and like uh, using someone's supercomputer and stuff, and I'm like, oh wait, Google Vision does this for like 20, 20 years. I was like, what? <laughs> so, um, um, and then I, but I also used for text analysis. I used various Python stuff, um, and uh, and then I classify them by gender. Uh, and I use on Flickr. I actually have full names of everyone, which feels like, like, it's a bit weird uh, that they provide that. But um, and so I use, uh, I find what location they're in because I also know I can figure out what country they're in. Uh, and then I look, is that a female or a male name in that country? And do we know that with a certainty higher than 80%? Um, Watch out, because there's more than two genders. There's actually 70 plus genders. No, I'm just joking. Yeah, it's a it's a joke point, but it it, <laughs> it definitely um, it's a real joke though because it, you because that's actually the dominant theory in in many gender studies yeah. programs. I mean, and it's also it, that is a thing, like because it's a sort of reification of of gender, like um, or of sex. I mean, like the it's. I'm, it's a sort of reification to sort of use the categories to study it. I mean, it's. I but think you are a certain you are an agent of the patriarchy, so you yeah, would do yeah, this. Yeah, it's, it's fair enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'm from Sweden, so <laughs> <laughs> so less so, but still. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and, and also like I combine this with uh, with qualitative analysis and more close reading of comments and looking at images and so on. Uh, and just try to develop like tools to easily look through comments and find representative comments for different, yeah, sort of that sort of more fairly pragmatic approach to the methods. <clears throat> and like the hypothesis categories, yeah, I, I don't wanna get too stuck into the different, but yeah. Um, is it comes from the literature mostly. Um, so emotional expression, sexualization, status, risk taking, and subordination superiority. Um, so um, emotional expression, there's uh, a lot of literature on, uh, this is our common hypothesis in looking at advertisement pictures, is that women smile more, uh, men look angry uh, and inaccessible. Uh, and men try to hide their facial cues in different ways. Like they might like put on sunglasses, put on a hat, and cap, and sunglasses. Um, and um, and it's it's like you can also there's also research that's quite interesting that it's like it perceived very differently uh, emotional expressions in in men and women. So like if uh, if a woman makes eye contact, they look very likable and uh, uh, approachable. Uh, if a man makes eye contact, it's, it's perceived as aggressive and, and dominant. Um, and also like positive, uh, if you're smiling as a woman, you seem to have high social status. If you smile as a man, you seem to have low social status. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna try to stop smiling. Uh, <laughs> 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 you know. <laughs> I, I pegged you as a beta. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so like, so how can we look at this in, in, in through image analysis? And, and so, well, facial expression detection. Uh, and then we actually also get headwear because that's included in the facial expression analysis, which is a bit funny. Uh, and like, so the differences aren't huge. It's also like, you should keep in mind also that it's not capturing everything. So it's like the actual uh, expression is much, much it's, the, it's much higher level of, of smiling than what we see here. Uh, but we, we can see there's quite a, it's, uh, it's very significant in the sense that the p-value is 10 to the power of minus 31. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, but what, what It's also like we have like three times higher expression of anger among men than among women. The rest of the people, what kind of expressions? Like yeah, so it's, so it's like, it's looking for an angry face. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, if there might be an angry face and it's just not finding it, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. often so happens. Looking so looking program. Yeah, okay. yeah. So this is a it's a it's a, it's a image okay. analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so running on hundreds of thousands. Can't detect level of testosterone because anger is related to that. So <laughs> machine I don't know if it's the proper interpretation. Yeah, it, it didn't have a the API didn't have a testosterone. <laughs> 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 Maybe <laughs> next version. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is a fairly basic, and we can also mm -hmm. use label detection, which like looks at different things that it sees in images, and then like labels them. And we can see that. Sunglasses are way, way, way more common among men, and head headgear is way more common among men, and caps, way more. Whereas eyes are more common among men. Where, where are you <laughs> coming from? If you, if you look to headgear, if, and they are Muslim women, yeah, all the Western Europeans or what's the population? Uh, I didn't classify. It's it's uh, just the because religion can be a factor that influences the. the yeah, yeah. So so idea. maybe a bunch of these head of these women. I mean, for reasons, reasons. yeah. So, but it's even though even with that taken into account, it's still yeah. quite a significant. It's significantly more common among men. Mm -hmm. um, and so, sexualization. Uh, so it's, it's sort of that the nudity of, of males is, is more understood as an expression of, of action, like action and power. Like I'm, they're, you're, they're highlighting muscles and they uh, they try to look powerful and strong. Uh, and women, meanwhile, have this like the sailing between Scylla and Shep, this with the right. problem again. Yeah. <laughs> between Scylla and a, between a rock and a hard place, um, yeah. <laughs> but because they they need to look inviting and accessible while avoiding looking slutty, and it's like highly coded of how to do that. And there's like uh, so they need to Im uh, like actually invite the male gaze, but also appear like they're not inviting the male gaze. Uh, so it's, this is hard to look at, and it turns into more of a qualitative thing. Uh, but so what we can see is that um, just looking at adult content detection on this platform is very, very low. Um, but you can see that on Instagram, 
it's higher among men than women, but on Flickr it's higher among women than among men. That's and surprising. It's surprising, but it's in a, in a sense not, because you can also see that like looking at the pictures, Flickr is a much more artsy platform. It's very focused on like art expressions and like the pictures are usually like very pretentious, like artsy pictures. And that sort of and you can also like if you actually go in and look at the pictures, that you can sort of see this playing out to a certain extent that the pictures of women are often very like like when there's proper nudity involved, it's like usually very artsy pictures. Uh, and it's like, oh the body is like a landscape. Uh, whereas like for guys it's more like <laughs> Yeah, so you're naked. <laughs> cool. <laughs> like, and you have muscles, right? Okay. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, and we can also look at looking at label detection. We see that that bodybuilding and bodybuilders are it's like of course extremely overrepresented among men. Um, right. So yeah, I'm, don't want to take too long with all these different hypotheses. Uh, but so looking at status is that. Attractiveness is judged very differently in men and women, and for women it's like, you should be beautiful uh, and family oriented. For men it's like, you should look powerful, you should ri look rich. And so we can sort of have a look at hypotheses that like encode this, uh, which is like, women are shown with fashion object new clothes, uh, men are shown with consumption objects, like showing that they have a lot of money. Uh, men are shown as professional, women are shown with children. Uh, and we can also see this like playing out in the data again, highly significant. Um, so, risk taking. Uh, <laughs> so this the encoding it probably be possible <laughs> to improve, but um, in general, there's like risk taking is perceived very different differently among men, men and women, and like uh, among men, it's perceived as as like you become more interest, uh, interesting for short term relationships. Uh, if you take a lot of risks, yeah. uh, which is like also intuitive. Um, so this is often represented uh, in the literature with mm -hmm. like pictures of alcohol and, and drugs, uh, which I think is, and of outdoor pictures, which I think is, I, I think you can do better than that representation, but I haven't <laughs> haven't done so yet. Like, but it would be interesting to look at more sports and like risk sport, like climbing um, and skateboarding and stuff like that. Uh, so, but we can see that there's uh, the sort of outdooriness, uh, things that are associated with the outdoors, and alcoholic beverages are more uh, common among men. Uh, so subordination superiority is like, especially in Goffman's argument, is very central, uh, which is like that women tend to be shown as, as childlike, and as uh, passive, helpless, and like, as he calls it, unoriented for action. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also, he calls it license withdrawal, because they're, they're looking like they're psych psychologically removed from a situation, and they, they need your help. Like you need to step in to save this poor little thing. Um, and uh, so women are portrayed as, as small and and also as being unstable. And like this is it's, I found this quite interesting. That so like one thing is that you might have heard of that men are photographed from below to look big, women are photographed from above to look small. But also like the thing with that women tend to tilt and to, to lean, uh, to look unstable, uh, and to be like, oh, like I can't even stand straight. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, that's how it's interpreted. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, and it's like, it's also like uh, lowering up the head. Uh, and Goffman has like in his, he has a book, uh, Advertising Gender, which he has like plenty of pictures of different animals doing things, and like uh, that it's like science of subordination in animals. <laughs> so like you have dogs doing this as sort of like as a sign of subordination. So uh, so he, he describes it as an acceptance of subordination, an expression of uh, ingratiation, submissiveness, and appeasement. Um, and also in line with this, that women tend to sit down because they're not ready for action; they're like passive sitting, uh, whereas men are supposed to be standing in large, ready for action. Um, so, and looking at this, this is quite interesting. So we see that men are both standing and sitting more. So what are women doing? The reason is that women are usually, like often taking picture from close up, because they're just sitting being beautiful, for instance. So you have like a picture up there 
like this much and they're not doing anything, they're looking hot uh, and being like helpless. Whereas men are like either sitting somewhere, uh, like you see a picture of them doing things. Um, where, wait, so where, where is the category for like the, 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 the just the, the, the head, just a headshot? Yeah, because um, that, that's a lot. A lot of women's pictures are like that. Yeah, the, they're the just culture, yeah, and, but that's usually what they are. They're just they're just like uh, self, just selfies. They have this. Yeah, and so you wouldn't be able to tell one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I could I should look into that because it's that's a uh, relevant to sort of add to this, right? Yeah. Uh, most so most of them are just like this. <laughs> just, that's it. That's as simple as that. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I, so this is pretty fun because we can look at at uh, the the head tilt. So we can look at uh, to how much they tilt their heads. Uh, and this isn't running on all the data yet because uh, yeah, done it yet. But so it's a little bit uh, less clean than I, it will be. But you can see a, a a difference if you're looking at the green line. It's just a difference. Uh, so it's basically uh, you can see that women are looking down more. And uh, uh, head roll, same thing. You can see quite a significant difference. Yeah. Um, and head panning as well. Uh, so yeah, so it's it's, it, it's it's quite fun to actually look at like where people, because you can literally get like a line where like where people are looking and how they're. Head. So I'm gonna try to do a cool visualization of the heat graph of, of head head it's directions. Actually, it's actually super strange if guys do anything like that. Like yeah. Any of those pictures, if a guy did the same yeah. thing, it'd be very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, how are like? Can we go into? Uh, so this is the more interesting part, and it's also the part that I haven't done yet. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Uh, so the question is like, how is gender policed? What happens if you deviate from the expectations? Um, and like the reason that I haven't like finished this, despite having spent too much time on it. Is that it's super difficult. I, it's it's and it's really fascinating reasons why it's difficult. Uh, and I started with sort of like sentiment analysis of pictures, and it didn't work well at all. Like everything I found that was like tagged as highly highly negative was all positive. It was all like sick bro or like wow crazy, uh, which are like positive comments, uh, but containing very negative words. Um, and so. I created a custom world list with just insults based on like the most common insults used on Facebook, according to another study. And it catches stuff like, bitch, you crazy. And like, that's positive. Mm -hmm. Because, and it just, everything, every way that I tried to capture negativity, it all captured like positive things or like, that are, if you just read the comments, like, like wow, this person is really upset. And mm -hmm. like, no, it's, it's a compliment, all right? Could it, could it mean that they are not policed? At the same time, we're seeing 75% of youth saying that they've experienced uh, bullying, 39% on a weekly basis. So, I would, I mean, mm. I would say that that's not the answer. Yeah. Um, but I, so I, I would think it's, it's. I also tried like emojis. I, I tried topic modeling. But it's just positivity all the way through, mm -hmm. um, and to, it seems that explicit negativity is very rare. Yeah. And the reason is, as, as I come to think of it, is that the policing itself is being policed, right? Because like, you don't want to be the asshole who's like being a bitch to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to insult people because like it's not a nice thing to do, and so it, it's expressed in different ways, um, and so negativity is more often expressed quite subtly. So in, for example, what is not being said, because there's quite strong expectations on this platform. So like if you upload, especially among youth, like you upload a picture, like a selfie, and your best friend isn't liking it, like, wow, like yeah. oof, even your best friend doesn't think you're pretty enough to go out far into double clicking. Like that's uh, it's mm -hmm. pretty, pretty strong statement. Yeah. Um, and you're also, there's also more subtle stuff, like you're expected to reciprocate. Like someone comments on you, like, wow, you're so hot you're sort of expected to comment back, like, oh, you're also so hot. Like, um, yeah. So there's a, a quite a complicated like expectation network here. And, and sheer, yeah. the, the number of likes, the number of times. Yeah, like yeah so, so that's uh, that's something that I, I looked at. I, I'm not sure if I... I think my kids, yeah. they react to this one was liked like 
Yeah. Six hundred times or something. Yeah. That's Maybe it's about two hundred times. Yeah. So it's. Uh, I'd so say that is the first yeah. something already to. This first step. Exactly, and, and that's that's something that exactly what I've tried to look at also, and like looking at the differences between men and women, um, and like. And I, I, so I one way, yes, yeah, I was going to say that explicit negativity appears to me to be almost absent because because yeah. it's because one of the other things that that happens so easily on the internet is that if you are explicitly negative for something that's politically correct, you can actually destroy your entire identity, like because yeah. the amount of people that will gang up on you and isolate you, it can happen just yeah. in one second. I think like the negativity is more the key point is that it's 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 I think I, most people experience this intuitively. It's it, the negativity is in, a, in the mode of absence. Yeah. It's precisely when nobody engaged with your post. Yeah. And you rate how well your post is doing based just purely on engagement because all the engagement is positive. Like the the most common co criticism of this is that Facebook doesn't have an, an a down like button. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of people that want Facebook to introduce a down like button, but they won't. So so it's yeah. it's all geared towards. Any engagement must be positive. Yeah. And I think it's preventing people from dealing with criticism in the real world. Because if you spend your entire childhood and if you spend your entire teenage years only getting positive feedback, yeah, then the same any time negative I'm criticism... Sure if I agree because no, I think it's... There's more stuff no. to do it. So you can no. make somebody a compliment and then make him or her feel really awkward no. about it. Because it's a fake compliment or it's not, it's not a real genuine compliment. Can you give an example? No, but, uh, what he says, uh, I agree, it's the, the danger is that if there are always only positive com comments, people still want to compare, then they will compare the number of positive comments. And then it becomes a race to the top of all points. Mean, more likes and more likes and more likes, and that's very dangerous. I mean, if you're looking at the statistics, it's the not being likes. experienced as like a but world it, of positivity. It's, it's like being experienced like personally. People are feeling like shit on these platforms. It's it's true, it's like very negative. But it's, it's 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 I think this is like this is a really important point is that is that people are expecting to get a hundred million likes for doing nothing. Like people just want endless positivity with no work or effort. Like and 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 so then any small deep any any so then if you do put in work. And no one recognizes it, or no one does anything. It's like this enormous traumatic thing because you're just used to just taking a selfie like this and getting a million likes. So it it's it's and and again, and again all of this all of this all of the software and all of the platforms that people are engaging on are so biased towards positivity that you actually don't experience like it just magnifies the negativity to such an insane level. No, so you know, if, if your language is positivity yeah. and you're not positive about somebody or some facial expression or something that you find, then you need to express it in, in that language. And that was my point, that there is some, there's a lot of subtlety in the detail there. Yeah. My daughter gets a comment and it's positive because there is no other way than to feedback positively. Since your hair is nice and then she's all upset because this friend tells me that my hair is nice and she should have said that my hair was great. whatever, great mm -hmm. or, or fabulous. I think this is exactly it. It's, it's about it. the language is different. And like I think probably no one in this room speaks this language. <laughs> <laughs> like at least I don't. Like try, looking at the comments and trying to get into it, it's like I have no idea what's going on in this conversation. Like I like literally like I don't understand the language. Like I can see that something is happening and I can see that I don't understand it. But it's like it's it's so many expectations about that I don't know of, and they're reading each other comments in in very un unexpected ways. Um, and I, it's also a, like this that negativity is forbidden. It sort of comes in because everyone is aware of that, and and everyone is aware that this that the contents of the of the messages is like doesn't mean anything. Like everyone's like, oh, you're so beautiful. You're the most beautiful I've ever seen. And so. Like, so no, there's you're the most beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> and like, so it's sort of because of it, like people are using that and their common knowledge of that we can't use negativity, and that's what you're seeing when you're using like these methods to try to find negativity. It's like, bitch, you you fucking crazy heart, <laughs> and like, uh, I hate you heart, like, because 
so they're they're using the common knowledge that like i i say this but i don't mean it and like if i say i hate you it's because you're so beautiful that i hate you because i'm not so beautiful but i know from from north from north america i know they only speak from north american slang but i know for a fact north american like one of the biggest features of north american slang is that it takes every negative word and it makes it a positive word like 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 the the most common one is you're a bad chick if you're a bad chick that means you're the hottest chick like so if so like she's bad or like and so so like but but then your algorithm would would search bad as a negative, but yeah. that's like the highest compliment. Like I'm a bad chick. Like so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. So and I guess that the whoever uh, writes this uh, the, the 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 systems for automatic uh, like sentiment analysis uh, is not a 14 year old American girl. <laughs> I think we can conclude that. <laughs> so it definitely needs a little bit more sophisticated measures, and I'm uh, I'm starting to use more sophisticated methods for it and uh, just gotten like uh, become a beta tester for like the Google's new tools for finding negativity uh, so that will be interesting and in, like looking at what dimensions they they use and like but another way is to exactly is looking at likes and like trying to look at status stratification so it's it's too primitive um, but it's still quite interesting is looking comparing the top 20 percent uh, with the bottom 20 percent for the both both genders and we can see that the top men smile a lot less than, than the bottom men. So like if you if you have a lot of likes and you're very like high on Instagram, you're smiling less mm -hmm. as a man. But if you're a woman, you smile more. So it makes sense. Uh, both genders hide their facial expressions more. Uh, so more more hats and sunglasses. You mean the, the, the top ones? Uh, yeah, yeah. The top Sorry. Ones yeah, the, the both top uh, top users are more cool, more mm -hmm. uh, inaccessible probably. And the, that sort of illustrates something that becomes the problem when you're using this approach, right? Because it doesn't capture. There's a whole other, whole bunch of other things that are coming into this. Uh, but yeah, so it's again it's early and more muscles in unity. Well. <laughs> It's, uh, it's apparently something that people like on the internet. <laughs> um, and top women, this I found interesting, are less surrounded by children and family and more by cars and fashion. Uh, and both uh, men and women stand up and sit down more often when they're <laughs> top, which sounds funny, but again, it's like it's more activity, more full body shots, less easy to do a selfie. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not uh, super convinced by this method. Uh, I think I need to do something clever uh, that captures the more differences between them. Um, so it's it's very much like just ongoing work. Um, and so I'm considering like different ways of continuing, and again, like using more intelligent measures to find hateful comments, find angry comments, and looking at what dimensions they uh, exist in and who, which users they target. Um, but it, it would also I would like to go in more in the in depth of like looking at the reactions, uh, but it's 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 super difficult and I'm um, I'm also curious about geographical differences because I have countries and there are some uh, hypotheses that uh, for example Eastern uh, countries tend to have like larger differences between genders and it would be quite interesting to see if Sweden is indeed uh, best. At uh, being feminist, <laughs> but um, so like, I can I can check that in the data. What would you define as being best? At being <laughs> yeah, let's not go into that. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, all right. So so just uh, preliminary sort of takeaways, uh, and uh, so. <laughs> it's a terrible picture. It looks very preliminary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's very creepy. It's it's a very suggestive image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't resist it. it was That's the archetypal female pose on Instagram. Yeah. Like, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite a, it's quite a telling. Um, so like, so first, um, gender representation. The, I mean, I think I, we can see that these hypotheses exist also, uh, that they're true also in social media, and that it is possible to use the computational lens to sort of allow us to bring this type of studying into uh, into the realm of, of images on social media, uh, which is, f for the field, is, is I think a quite an important result. 
Um, and I, to be honest, I was like quite surprised that like that the hypothesis actually turned out to be true because some of them were just like weird to me, like especially like the head tilting stuff. <laughs> so, really, <laughs> like okay. <laughs> um, and so, so also like just thinking more about the social structures and again. Uh, when we go in to the sort of nitty gritty of working with data and thinking about social patterns and in, in social data, I think it's the feeling of, of what social structure is is quite different from from what we get when we use with modeling. Like, because um, I've used a lot of approaches using more simulation modeling, and and you have this idea of like mass interaction on this level, and then you get like emergent pattern. Um, and it's something that happens like above, in some sense, is the micro macro sort of thinking. But working with this data gave me a completely another feeling of what a social pattern, what a social structure is. Um, that they seem and feel much more like a language, that they're simultaneously like the rules of the game and the playing of the game. Like we don't have the separation of like the rules of the game happen here in the code, and then we get an emergent pattern that's up here. But this is more like the emergent patterns are the rules of the game. So they're like both below and above and in between. And it's like, and people are reflexively using the structures in their communication. And in fact, like much of the communication is just referring to common expectation, common, mm -hmm. like common social practices, common social expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and the expectations is like how we communicate. Uh, what we say gets its meaning through expectations, right? And like the expectations at the same time or something that we learn about through communication. And it's like, it just, to me, just totally changed like the perspective on what emergence is and what complexity is in this system. <coughs> like, it just gives a totally different feeling from it. And I, I find it just personally interesting with like the, what we were talking about, like with the, how the method and epistemology gives an ontology. And like, you can really feel like just working with the data, like how you're thinking about the system sort of is transformed by the, by the way that you see the system. Um, so it, it's, it's quite uh, very interesting. And it's also related to the, the tying back that meaning is, is contextual. Like meaning often isn't where you would expect it to be. Uh, because as we said, like like basically all messages are, are positive, but there's basically no information in, in the content of the messages. Like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. It can be an insult given the right expectations. Uh, and like, you're fucking crazy. It can be a wonderful compliment. Like, and the words don't really mean much, and and people are conscious that the words don't mean much. So they like, it's sort of, uh, and there's more information was not being said than what is being said. But, and certain messages can be sent that we can't really see in the data that are very subtle and, and like hitting in the specific social context of how they interact that we, we can't get data on. Because it's like, there's a lot of private conversations or a lot of real world conversations that are like interacting with this and that are forming the expectations of their interaction. Uh, and like they really seem to go around with like this like model of the social world in their heads that they're using when they're understanding each other. So it's I'm, it's very sophisticated. Like also looking at interviews and volunteer studies where they're talking to young people using Instagram, it's like really I was really surprised with how sophisticated their social interaction is. Like Maybe I'm just not a very social person. <laughs> like is their skills. Is meaning just also gender, because I expect somehow maybe there will be some differentiation in how people express yeah. their admiration. Yeah. Like no, absolutely, absolutely, and like, Especially and that's part of the expectations, right? The expectations are also about the expectations, how you express your expectations. Oh, no. Like it's just, yeah. it's just all the way up, <laughs> turtles all the way down, um, <coughs> and so. I, it's just to conclude, I think this paper feeds into an understanding of, of social media that uh, it, that it's really not leading to an increasing fluidity of identity, but that it's to paraphrase uh, Norbert Elias, it's a, it's a gilded age of a cage of conformity, uh, where users compete for for social status and relevance, uh, and instead of presenting identity as something malleable and fluid, it presents us with a single canvas on which to sketch our identity, uh, and thereby conflating all the, the multiplicity of our, our different roles, conflating self-expression, self-communication, and self-promotion into a single identity. Um, and so maybe the increasing connectivity brought by social media does not in fact connect, it, connect us, but it 
paradoxically distances us from not only from our uh, from others but also from ourselves that commodifies social relations it turns self-expression into branding and turns dialogue into a struggle for status and relevance um, and so in a sense like while the mirror that the social uh, provides us with it now seems to reflect us with sort of digital clarity uh, it only makes makes it harder to see yourself and I, James Baldwin puts this beautifully in, in the fire next time uh, all of us know whether or not we're able to admit it that mirrors can only lie, that death by drowning is all that awaits one there. It is for this reason that love is so desperately sought and so cunningly avoided. Love takes off the masks that we fear we cannot live without and we know we cannot live within. And I think that this, that summarizes something about our relationship to each other and to social media and, and social identity. So, um, yeah, so unfortunately it, it doesn't tie up as much as I would have liked uh, with the sort of agency structure debate and the complex realism. But it, at least it shows the sort of approach of keeping interpretation, keeping narrative in the process of analyzing, analyzing social media and analyzing social interaction, but also bringing in uh, computational tools, bringing in sort of complexity thinking, thinking explicitly about emergence and how it plays out. Um, and so it, it's, uh, it's an interesting sort of working with this research on, on gender and then at the same time trying to sort of sketch a, a, an approach for thinking about uh, digital data and, and complexity. Um, but so I, I very much would like your, your feedback on, on this and ideas on like how to proceed and uh, how to tie this up. So yeah, that was it. <laughs> I was just wondering, first off, how how you plan to uh, approach gender moving forward with this this project? Because it's it's I don't know how how deep you are in the the contemporary discussion or literature on gender, but it's it's become such a such an explosive uh, explosive explosively um, antagonistic discursive domain, and there's um, there seems to be nothing but polar opposition between people who are framed as traditional biological essentialists with gender and people who are framed as emancipatory constructivist multiplicity view of yeah. gender and and how how do you think that your work could inform this debate or how do you think that these models yeah. can be applied to the research that you do and wh what do you think about that I mean, I, I see this contribution as more of a contribution to uh, to the research. I mean, like that debate, I think describes better the sort of societal debate. <laughs> I think that in in the in the social sciences, and uh, there is more of a level-headedness, uh, at least to a certain extent. Um, and like, I yeah, the the sort of discussion about the biological gender or not is like it's super infected also in. And gender studies, so I, I plan to not go into that. <laughs> so you <laughs> want to avoid it? I, I mean, so to a certain degree, I mean, like this comes from and, and starts from the idea that gender is to a certain degree constructed, right? Because it's like uh, we perform gender. Gender is about expectations. Gender is something we become, not something we're born as. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, to a certain degree, doesn't really matter, like whether. I mean, it's it's whether there's a starting point somewhere that's biological, whether there's a push somewhere. I mean, it's still interesting to see, sort of see how it develops and like what the process of that social construction is. And like- But you just men mentioned uh, biological gender. Maybe you actually want to distinguish between gender and sex. It's yeah. much more simple to- Yeah, and it, that's also a question like, what, what am I I'm actually looking at yeah. sex, right? And then you simplify it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, just using the terminology that they're using. So <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. You can look in the gender handbook, yeah. gender politics handbook, and it's, it's you can clear your mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm using Goffman, but also uh, the literature in, in, in gender studies, uh, which so it's because that's basically the field I'm contributing to. Gender right? politics handbook is very specific. And yeah. It's very helpful. 
you said uh, you, you are not sure how it ties up the first uh, part with, with the second. As you know that, uh, so coming back to this graph between like complexity and complication, which is called, I think this study uh, really illustrates the, 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 the entanglement of both parts very yeah. well. Because when, when you study uh, social context, which should be like more complexity side, and you, you shouldn't expect uh, expect those you know social structures being carried uh, on there. You nonetheless discover them there. Yeah. So so they are really you know uh, the, the social organization would suppose that you you will not like they, they they will be lost, but they are carried on. So yeah. so I think it's a clear uh, clear illustration of of your theoretical uh, yeah. concept in the, in the first place. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's what I was hoping for, yeah. aiming for, but I feel like <laughs> yeah, okay. there's still yeah. some direction I want to go with yeah. tying it up and like yeah. uh, trying to also operationalize yeah. some of that, yeah. uh, which might be impossible. Uh, I have some uh, some yeah. ideas about, uh, you know, like how you could use actually the, the complexity lens to, to Explain the complication part, but but it's uh, maybe like too too much complication <laughs> for now. Maybe maybe over a group. But uh, one more thing I wanted to tell you, uh, may, maybe an idea uh, about how you could detect that policing uh, of you know like who is behaving how is not looking what they are expressing, but how the person is reacting, mm -hmm. because. Uh, at least I, I don't know like, how how well supported scientifically it is. I have an imp impression that if you compliment somebody, uh, those people start speaking more. You know, like if you if I tell you like what a nice uh, presentation, what a, what a what a wise you know presentation, yeah. then you will, like will produce a, a longer sentence in, in response, and you will like be more eager to react uh, and and uh, particularly interact with me. Yeah. And if I say something, and maybe you know, like uh, in, in on a uh, like word by word level, very positive, but you understand that I'm criticizing you or policing you, you'll avoid me. Yeah. You know. So so in that sense, if it's possible, like in in the data, if you if you can detect that, you could maybe see a pattern of like who felt really complimented and who who didn't. Yeah, that's a, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, too. I, I also have the impression that uh, people are more likely to react on positive comments than on yeah. negative between brackets comments that they're not as good as they expect. Yeah. Yeah, except, except this presentation, I guess, because if it came out of the comments of the anger physicist, <laughs> it's, it's quite a long response. <laughs> it must be that you're a very paradoxical creature. <laughs> But building further on what Mahatma said, I think the two um, dimensions of complicatedness and um, complexity, I think it can be better understood by looking at several levels, one on top of the other, where the interactions are both up and down. Emergence is from down to up, but then you also have downward causation. Once the higher level is kind of specified, it's going to influence what's going up, what's going uh, on on the lower level, and yeah. you typically get a reinforcement between yeah. the two, and that is what you probably see with these uh, stereotypes that are kind of being reinforced by the social media. That is that people start behaving in a certain way, which creates a pattern, which then becomes an expectation, yeah. and then the emergent expectation makes people behave more like the way yeah. they are expected to do, and the whole thing kind of reinforces itself, and you create a new norm. So you have a an emergent norm, but it's not that it starts from the bottom and then it emerges and it's there, it goes up and then it comes down and then it goes up and yeah. it comes down again. And so the different levels interact and it's not only one level to the next level, but yeah. all the levels mm -hmm. interact to some degree and that's what makes society wicked. Yeah. That at any level something may start, it starts influencing the levels below or above yeah. and then everything gets very messy. Yeah, it's in the sense that emergence doesn't just occur from the bottom up, but it's also cuts through the levels. And you get like emergence between structural factors, that things that are on the higher level uh, and things that are on the lower level. And you get emergence that is like on a very unclear level in a sense. So yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very good way of thinking of it. Yeah. And how do you plan this study as a cross-national comparative case study or 
Uh, yeah, so with looking at the, the countries, I mean, I can so take you out some... differentiation by country. Yeah, yeah, so I, I have, uh, uh, on some I have like geotagging, so I know like exactly where they send it from, and others I just know where, which country, uh, which city. And so that I, then I can, for example, take out uh, some aggregate measure of the level of differences between, for example, like how, how men and women are commented, like to what extent do people use different words for writing about women and for writing about men. And I can take that as like just a, a distance uh, in a highly multidimensional space. Um, and then I can look at those, how, how those differences between the countries, and I can just make a cool map with colors and stuff. <laughs> like, yeah. So you're looking also at the self representation of the people, not only at the comments there. Yeah, so. Because in, in that case, I have a, a, a personal experience. I'm Romanian, and I live here, and I live in Italy. So it's very limited because it's just from my circle of, of people that I have in my, in my Facebook and social media. And what I've noticed, there are differences higher differences between women in Eastern Europe and women in Western yeah. Europe on how they self-represent themselves on social media, yeah. but there are not so high differences between men. What are the differences? Well, that's another discussion. Oh, <laughs> <I didn't understand. laughs> that's, 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 uh, that would be the, the finding of the study. That's uh, not the but I want to know your folk knowledge. For example, <laughs> on self-objectification of women. And you think it's Eastern women do it more yes, than uh, Western women? Yeah, and it's also a uh, an age differentiation. Younger women, they are more than younger women here. But it's like limited to a few hundreds, let's say, and yeah. I'm uh, not working on that. You mean that uh, younger women will more kind of show themselves as sexy objects? Yes, there than here. I also yeah. have that impression. I mean, I, I, I ideally go to a vacation in Bulgaria and I do yeah. see the difference. Yeah. And it's, it's not a, a matter of education or social status, because I have people from academia in my list. I know, yeah. like, I know that this, uh, regardless of the social status or, or income. Yeah, right. no, but I've seen some study implying the same thing. Well, uh, I don't know. The differences are bigger, but I, I don't remember. It's the just my, my experience, my how I perceive yeah. things, but I didn't read anything about it, so maybe it's something that I've already. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've seen a, a study implying that, So, but it, it would be interesting to look at, because uh, I can actually go into that. And also look at the responses, like how different they are, which, I mean, language is always tricky, because yeah. certain languages change. Like the adjectives, depending on it. Uh, you will need an expert in every country but to look at this. But I suppose it should be e easy to find the difference in the type of words people use in comments for women and for men. Yeah, yeah, but if, if for example, you haven't uh, found anything yet uh, in that respect. Uh, uh, I haven't looked at the the nation national level. No, no, I but I mean just uh, in general. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So yeah, I've, I've done. I looked at that, and I also looked at so what. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff that's not in this because it wasn't interesting enough or didn't like find something that was like that I could interpret yet or that I haven't worked enough with it. Um, but so yeah, I, I looked at the differences in, in comments between men and women and uh, emoji use. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, there are some differences. Gender, and gender, it's obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Women send more hearts and, yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. smiling yeah, it's, it's it's hard it's eyes. And it actually, if, if men send emojis to each other, it's very <laughs> awkward. Men don't <laughs> men don't actually like sending emojis. Like I, I've gotten well, that's I've why gotten, I I've gotten comments that you know don't send emojis to me. <laughs> like that, like if, if if a man sends an emoji to another man, it's perceived as gay. <laughs> like, like, uh, like <laughs> it's, even it's too much. Like, <laughs> not, like I'm, I'm, I'm used to girls sending me like a little winky face or something like that. Yeah, it's way too. Much. <laughs> oh, so that's why I make everyone awkward. <laughs> male, male, male. We have to break down the barriers of male, male emoji shirt. <laughs> yeah, send, send a thumbs up to that. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, there's, uh, on that, there's quite a lot of studies, right? So that's also um, why I didn't look in specifically to that that much yet. But, um, and I tried, I tried to look a little bit like classifying the top and the bottom and looking at what comments they're getting, but it's, uh, um, yeah, it's, I need to work more on it. But, yeah. Uh, a comment on the work, uh, this thing on, um, Media and images, and uh, related to um, uh, basically the detection of 
policy, I think one of the issues that you may have is that uh, when people post, I mean, uh, when people post uh, a photo on social media, they're, uh, they're very conscious of what is their audience. So even if it's, if, even if it's a public uh, post in the end, uh, it's only their connections that end up seeing the post in practice, so they, if they afford to post a, 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 a photo that could be in other contexts, could be polished, it's because they know that their friends are not going to polish that. Yeah. Um, so that might be an issue, I think. But on the other hand, I've seen lots of, you know, really, really hateful comments on, on, well, on, on other topics where I, I can imagine similar things on related to gender. Um, so maybe if you look at uh, celebrities or uh, actors or politicians posting, there you can have enough uh, big of an audience to expect some uh, policing reactions. Yeah. That could be. In, in, in such a space, it also makes more sense to for someone to write a hateful comment, right? Because, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, because you know if you're writing it among your friends, everyone's going to be like, "Why? Why are you an asshole? Like, yeah. <laughs> why are you being mean?" But like, if you write it to a good, to a very famous person, you sort of get lost in the crowd, and you yeah. can sort of speak to the crowd yeah. as an anonymous person. So it's it's very good good suggestion. So would it be possible to characterize the group? Because then you know what is being policed. So, uh, categorizing the the group that are receiving negative yeah. comments. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Because that is what is being protected, in fact. Yeah. Or attracted towards, or yeah. rejected from. Yeah, and, and, and that's exactly what I wanted to do from the start with this, like that. <laughs> yeah. So it's I wanted to to look at hateful comments and then look at the set of images that get negative comments that get hateful comments and like how do these compare to the to the rest of the images like can we see that these are like can we see a gender difference in, in the behavior uh, and it's I mean it's also just interesting with what types of insult people get uh, it's like it's quite interesting because that's also relating to the structures and it's in some ways like the extreme expression of like uh, of gender and of expectations so. Well, I was, I was sort of thinking in the line of uh, hypothesizing a community. And so somebody's posting some picture, and then the comment is in the context of that mm. hypothesized okay. you know, characterization of the group. Because that is what's to be protected. Uh, but maybe it's self referential because it's your outcome, what the group actually yeah. is. I don't know. Or is it the policing instruments that you're looking for? Yeah. Uh, so. Well, I'm making sense. Or? Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> the way that I'm saying it. I mean, that it's it's two things that are interesting. There's like, so first, what are being what things are being policed, and then and sort of how are they being policed, yeah. and, like, and by whom. Uh, but the tricky part in this, like, since it is contextual, and since it sort of happens over time. It's exactly the context. And I. Because there's a yeah. very small text in a specific, much yeah. larger context. Exactly. So if this context would be known, then yeah. this little sentence in the comment, which is completely mean, meaningless, at least to me, yeah. in the context, it could be in the world. Yeah. And that's the so bummer, because I don't have like data on specific users over time. And that's yeah. like what I would need to uh, for most of these things that are. Yeah, and also like tracing emergence over time, because it's also interesting to look at like if someone tells you to stop behaving like a fucking faggot, like do that, does that affect how you behave? Yeah. And how does it affect how you behave? Um, yeah, in a, in yeah. A, in a <laughs> it's probably <laughs> probably the most likely outcome. <laughs> but the context is also related to sentiment uh, and irony detection, which is a big issue on, on social media, because I mean. Even for a human, if you just see a tweet, I don't know, you see a retweet of uh, Donald Trump, and the comment is like, very cool. Yeah. <laughs> <Great idea. laughs> you cannot tell yeah. if it's True. ironic or not. But if you yeah. go to the profile of the, of the person that made the comment, you look at what other accounts is following, or yeah. she is following, it's much easier. So uh, it's true that you don't have uh, 
you don't easily have access to the previous uh, content generated by a certain user. But you can, for example, uh, get, I don't know, like on Twitter, I guess it's in our internet, you, get, you can get somehow a profile of the person by the things that that person follows. So that maybe can be used as a concept, as yeah. a contest to classify your account. Of course, it also explodes your input space. No, that's, that's a good idea. Without that contest, it's, it's actually, I think it's simply impossible to discriminate a very cool that is ironic from a very cool that is yeah. mm -hmm. chubby. Which, I mean, it, that it doesn't, as, as long as it's not, I mean, I don't need to find all the hateful comments in a way. Like, it's sort of fine if I lose 70% like, of the sarcastic comments or like all of the sarcastic comments. Uh, because I, what I need is just like some samples, some hopefully representative samples of the type of things that people are reacting on, the type of like, uh, so I can look at the differences between the sets and stuff like that. Because like, hopefully people aren't, wouldn't be more sarcastic and a certain type of insulting and <laughs> from another type of insulting, but yeah. I wonder, I wonder also about um, the problem of the, the so-called uh, silent, silent majority that, that a lot of the um, progressives or liberals were surprised by Brexit and Trump and um, one, of the common, one of the common responses to their surprise is, is that actually 50% of the population believes something but actually can't socially vocalize it. Yeah. And and so then it's 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 progressives and liberals are it's it's more socially acceptable for progressives and liberals to voice dissent against something and for that to be socially accepted that they dissent. But for conservatives or or traditionalists they just believe what they believe and they stay silent about it because they know if they vocalize about it on social media they'll be ganged up and isolated. So I don't know how you'd factor that into the into the analysis, but I think it's an important dimension of what's going yeah. on with the bubbling. And I, I think it's also, I mean, that's a sort of, I think that comes very intuitive to people, uh, like this, in, in these settings, for instance. So say that you're uploading uh, a selfie and your best friend doesn't like it, uh, and doesn't, you know, plus like, or say that, oh, you, oh my God, you're so beautiful. Then you you're gonna you're going to expect, and the thing that's gonna give you anxiety is that there's likely a silent majority of like thousands of people who've seen your picture and they think you look ugly and they fucking hate you. That's like what your brain is saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like that's the thing that's giving you anxiety. Uh, so it's not that your friend didn't like it specifically, but it's sort of these things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and because you know that there's this this sort of social expectations that you can't right, mean things. Uh, which is, and probably your brain makes it worse than this, like, <laughs> no one actually cares about yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that is what hack goes on in people's brains. Yeah. So there's a very dangerous phenomenon, this kind of amplification of visibility of status. People are obsessed about status because, of course, they want to do yeah. better than others and not do worse. But if you compare yourself with the whole world, it's impossible to do better. You will always do worse than so many other people, so you're constantly anxious to try to get one little level up and kind yeah, of climb to the top. If you are in a small group, uh, you can be the best of your car also. You can be the, the, the nicest one of the family, but you can't be the best one at the, at the world one. Yeah. So you will always feel, and that, that's why the social media, really, I think, makes it really so depressing. Yeah, and it's, it's also this thing that it just makes social interaction and like social relations more efficient in the way of like you can keep like you can have so many friends and you can like interact with all of them and you can uh, you can be uh, you can ex have expectations that people would like your pictures and like it's just a higher pace. It's just more efficient in some sense. Like well, if it, if you were producing something, it would be efficient. It's more efficient for cheap, easy, quick yeah. information. Yeah. It's less efficient for deep conversation. Like yeah. And and yeah. It's more videos. It's very separate. Hmm? More videos. No. Before the, no. the rise of I mean, the yeah. easier it becomes to send certain types of information, 
the more we will be busy with that information, the less time we will have for all the other information. And the information that is more difficult for social yeah. media is the one that suffers. The information which is like thinking deeply about what does this a policy of Trump really imply, rather than I like it or it's stupid what he said. No, but, but then we, what we, we, I'm not sure. We used to go to, to a bar and do the same thing, you know, to a pub and just enjoy yourself and then evaluate all the time. So this saves a lot of time, I think. It's just you're blind. If I see my kids do that, they do that for an hour and they know a lot of stuff. But the problem is they know, the problem is what do they know? They know a lot of very superficial things. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they have a lot of time left to, to do that. Other things. It's, it's, it's efficient. It takes, it doesn't take so much time to do it. You can have a lot of feedback in a very short time. That's true, but the, 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 the question is, that information is not just time, it's also it's, it also takes up your attention. All yeah. the attention you spend on this kind of information yeah. do not longer take on thinking about what does it really mean. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people that now are rebelling against this by saying they don't want to read online articles anymore, they want to revert back to books or they want to revert back to older older media because there's a, it's a different like the McLuhan medium and the message that, that the medium you're engaging on means even more than the particular content that you're 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 engaging with. And I don't I, I mean I think these this raises this all the social this is a great presentation all the social media work that you're you're doing raises really important questions because I, I it, it seems and the you know you feel like you're competing with the whole world and that I've been thinking a lot more about this like whether it's athletics or whether it's beauty or whether it's academics or whether no matter what it is you're measuring yourself against I mean, the best that could possibly be on the planet right now exactly and it's how do you get how you know so I don't know for for me sometimes I just feel like just shut down all the social media accounts like get rid of them all because the, but I don't you know or or at least. I, I don't know what this would do to teenagers because all the social media stuff that got that seriously got amplified for me happened when I was in college, so I was out of high school. But if I was a kid today, like, what a, what a crazy, but what I think a crazy. The real problem is not the, the competition that is stimulated yeah. because people are not um, trying to be better. They try to present themselves better. And then everybody is, is in this kind of crazy competition. They all try to look better than they are cleverer mm -hmm. than they are, smarter than they are, richer and so on, and everybody is competing with those fake images of the others that neither the others, that are the no. role models, that they are not what they seem to be, and this is like... Uh, yeah, it's an inflation of expectations, yeah. you, the others make themselves look better than they are, so you have to make yourself look even better in the end. People are not trying to be better, to look better, yeah. it's always a fight. To look better, yeah. Uh, I don't think, that, that would not be sustainable, I think. I think we're yeah. yeah. doing yeah. with this it's stress and frustration. No, it's it's exactly. Just, you so know, you have depression, and what the findings show is it's the highest depression ever among teenagers. Well, that's, but that's what I mean, though, as I'm saying that I, I think it's a better strategy to ground your life away from social media and to, to maybe use social media on some some constrained basis. But if you but if you inflate your identity on just purely on social media, I think like it's it's, yeah. it's mostly destructive. Um, yeah. I just can only look at my kids and they're very honest. And she is really beautiful, whatever the comments, you know, about somebody else. Yeah, so they, they compare, they're, you know, fair. She she, she, has, she needs a lot of attention, but it's fair. She's really beautiful. Or he is really good at something, you know. It's, it's a big audience, yeah. it's a big group. Yeah. But they learn to sort of deal with it. Uh, with the exposure and the, and the comparison. So yeah, but they always want to be more beautiful, and the, those standards are, are yeah, unrealistic, but at some point, especially for children. It stops. I think it's, you know. Like the highest level of cosmetic surgery among young people in Ireland. It's those standards are unrealistic. Yeah, that's point. Uh, it's, it's yeah. And there's a fixation on All the girls are standard. They all want to look the same. They have so many so ideals. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 awesome. There's also these <coughs> quite interesting phenomena, like more emergent phenomena, like uh, the friendship paradox, for instance, <coughs> which is that your friends on social media, on average, have more friends than you do. Uh, uh, yeah. And they're uh, on average also happier than you are. Uh, 
so there's a bunch of stuff like that there like like if you're used to doing I mean it's like the, the same way that you should adapt your traffic to the, the pace of the of the road but the pace of the road that you see is higher than the pace of the road that the average pace of the road because your sample like contains a lot of people that ride faster than you do <laughs> and that will pass you and so the average speed is perceived as, as higher than this which has this self like driving feedback where you're like, oh, like I'm driving way slower than everyone, like from, from what I've seen. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and that's, that's sort of dynamics, like when it's not intuitive and <clears throat> it becomes sort of hard to like take that into account. And uh, I think that that is like one of the ways that social media is a bit dangerous because I, I'm also not sure that the, the people who own the platforms are like compensating for that in a sense. So all of these complex and emergent dynamics that are happen on these platforms. Uh, I suppose you know the work of Johan Bohm. Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah, he uh, he, that's the what the one I was referring to because yeah, yeah, he's yeah. done a that's, that's that's one of my PhD students. Oh really? Yeah, uh, yeah, I met him now in Mexico and I think. Uh, yeah, he has been also warning about these things and he has stopped all his social media when he's finally understood that it was <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we were presenting at this. I uh, presented this as the the CCS as well. Uh, we were in the same session actually. So, yeah. and I'm actually doing a spin-off study of the, the same thing <laughs> on Twitter. Maybe we have to go for a drink. Social media message. <laughs> 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 <laughs>